Good morning, Andy. Um, just a note, Nick is running just a few minutes um, late because of a clinical issue. Oh, thank you. I should say Nick MDH. <laughs> That's what I figured. And Helen, good to see you. Kit, hello. Good morning. It took me a minute to get my mic going there. <laughs> but hi. Hi. And uh, as we're just checking in here, uh, know that we've already experienced a few technology gremlin gremlins poking around. So uh, hang in there if we have issues. Always a good idea, members, to um, remove, shut anything else that you don't need up on your screen to give yourself the bandwidth that you need if you have uh, issues. So like close your Outlook or whatever you need to do um, to make sure you've got what you need. Uh, and I'm going to just check in again with Jess Burke. Jess, how are we doing from your vantage point? Are we ready to begin all things technology wise? Uh <laughs> Yeah, I can try and figure this out while we're working. Okay. Hopefully. And Jessica, looking through the participant list, are you feeling good to go? I think so. I think we just now reached a quorum from um, barely <laughs> in terms of 13 people. Um, right. But I think good. we officially reached our thir 13 at least member quorum. So okay. we can move forward. Okay, well, we've got a couple minutes of just getting um, getting things started. And so why don't we go ahead and, and do that? So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, uh, some words of information as we now do regularly at the beginning of our meetings. Uh, if you are a task force member and if it possible, um, we sure appreciate your keeping your cameras on. It really helps to feel part of a group when your uh, member cameras are on. So thank you, particularly when we're having conversation, uh, that's just ever so helpful. Um, also use your raise hand feature. Uh, you can find that down at the bottom of your screen. I think in the platform we're using now, um, click on the reactions button and you'll see the hand up thing there. Uh, and I was just learning a whole new thing from Jessica this morning uh, that apparently if you just raise your actual hand long enough and you might need to get it close to the screen, weirdly, it'll raise its hand for you, which is just kind of freaking me out here. So uh, things change uh, at every moment. Platforms change with new information. So there you go. Uh, you can all be trying, <laughs> trying that out today. Uh, we all also remember to avoid using chat as a part of our discussion for reasons of public transparency. And frankly, not every member is always looking at the chat. So if there's conversations going on there, sometimes it's really hard to feel part of both. So please refrain from using chat for conversation. It's okay, members, to use it if you're having some sort of technical thing that you need to uh, alert people to. But in terms of adding to the conversation through chat, we'd appreciate you um, staying away from that. Members, also, uh, go ahead and, and get on Mural. You should still have the um, uh, password for that and the link for that in previous emails, if not the one for this particular meeting. Um, uh, remember, members, join as a visitor. You don't need a membership, nothing like that. Just join as a visitor. It'll give you that avatar. You don't need to put your initials in there if you don't want to. Uh, and remember the whole thing about hovering over either my or Jessica's picture, or excuse me, my picture, or Jess's um, Minnesota, the the square blue box with an M in it. We've got those stars by our um, our information at the bottom center of the mural screen. If you hover over us and click on follow Stacy, then if you get lost on the mural, you at least have a starting point on how to find us again. So those skills will come back to you pretty quickly. 
Uh, and in a moment, I see that a lot of you are already on. I'll go ahead and turn off the cursor so you'll only see mine and Jess's cursor and your own actual cursor with no name attached to it. So hang in there for a little while. I just am not good at multitasking. All right. Uh, a welcome also to any observers that we have today. Uh, we all appreciate that you're here. We all appreciate that you're interested in this topic. The meeting, as you know, is being live streamed uh, to um, YouTube and minutes will be posted of this meeting on the task force website. Oh, it's what about a week after the meeting is over. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Jess um, or Chrissy, if you're on. Uh, and a note to all observer. Uh, we're required to follow open meeting laws. And so the public uh, is able to attend the meetings, but it doesn't require us to record the meetings for all posterity. Uh, so just as with the other uh, task forces and advisory councils that are assisted by at least man, um, there are no plans to make any changes to do any recordings this, this time. So if you're not able to sit in the meeting live through the benefit of YouTube, then you're gonna to need to rely on the minutes that will be posted to, to understand what happened at the meeting. Uh, further on, I want to just remind everybody of the task force's charge. And Jess, if you could move, I think, yep, to the next slide. Um, uh, Psychedelic Medicine Task Force was established to advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues related to the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. For the purposes of this work, psychedelic medicine means MDMA, psilocybin, I've been practicing that word, and LSD. Uh, also, to keep in the center of our, uh, our work, um, the task force's charge is to survey existing studies of scientific literature, compare efficacy of psychedelic medicine in specific instances, to develop a comprehensive plan for legislative review. So the slides that Jess, Jess is sharing with you on the screen give you a little bit more information about that social if, if need be, go back and forth between those two. And uh, that's a good one too, that uh, talks a little bit more about developing the comprehensive plan. I will not read all of that through. And with all of that, I'm gonna turn it over to our chairperson. Uh, and Jess, you could go ahead to the next slide because I think the next slide, yeah, there we go, is uh, all for Jessica and go ahead, it's all yours, Jessica. Yeah, thank you so much, Stacey, and, and welcome all task force members and members of the public viewing this today. Um, so these slides are to remind us of our overall work cadence so that we can complete our charge. Um, so you'll note that we are now in our um, in the plan development and recommendation phase. The oh, next and if I could just interrupt just a second, Jess, if you could go back to the, the, the um, chart. I there we go. That's what you need up. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. So, so yeah, so for the next five months, we're going to be focusing on building up our shared knowledge, breaking down the work into bite-sized pieces, and pulling together a variety of recommendation ideas before we begin to narrow and prioritize this starting in July. So just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today on the agenda. We go to the next slide. Yeah, so we're going to review um, the desired meeting outcomes. So the agenda, um, so here's the agenda and how these items support the accomplishment of our charge. So the first thing we need to do is approve our meeting minutes from the January 8th meeting and take care of other logistical business and information sharing. Then we'll move on to update an update on surveying of the scientific literature. So Caroline Johnson is ready to share information on identified health conditions for each drug to help focus our work and remember we we have no authority to call for new studies, um, and we must rely on existing literature that fits within the parameters we defined at our previous meetings. Next, we'll do a legal overview presentation. Presentation. So unsurprisingly, legal concerns and implications are woven throughout our work together. 
Last month, we heard from Izzy Ali from the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies and Robert Rush, a Colorado-based attorney with extensive experience in psychedelic law. To further educate and prepare us to make informed recommendations to the legislature, we have another legal presentation today by Dr. Mason Marks, a lawyer and visiting professor of law at Harvard Law School. Dr. Marks is also a Florida Bar Health Law Section professor with the Florida State University and a visiting fellow at the Yale Law School for Information Society Project. Uh, we'll then have a brief break for about 10 minutes and then um, we'll continue with working group status reports. So this will be led by Chrissy Doach, which um, she'll give a brief overview of where things stand with the three work groups and where the work is headed so that we can understand how small groups can be used and in what sequence to assist our legislative charge. And I just want to emphasize to these groups will be shaped by the work that they create. And we really do want to encourage engagement with these working groups um, as much as we can. Um, the working groups will naturally shift uh, with the work, but until clear changes are needed, we will mirror a tentative schedule um, as we've outlined. Um, next up, we'll uh, vote to finalize the charter. Uh, so we put that on kind of hold last meeting to make some adjustments. So we've been plugging away at finalizing this. Um, while task force charters aren't required, they are helpful in establishing agreements and uh, among all of us as to how we will be defining and approaching our work. And we'd like to wrap up that today. Um, and then next we'll talk about the final report formatting for preliminary discussion. Um, in order to figure out how to approach this work, it helps to have a clear concept of what the end results, such as a report to the legislators could look like. So Jess and Stacy have pulled together some example reports uh, from other task force to view and to help our thinking about how our report and the detailed nature of our recommendations should come together. Um, next, I wanna talk about some membership updates. So first, I just wanna welcome Nick Lennertz uh, from MDH, um, being appointed as the MDH uh, person replacing Chris Tol Tolkes. So um, we'll give more time for Nick to properly introduce himself, himself when we do the roll call in just a few minutes. Um, so I just wanna give a brief update now regarding the Ojibwe seat, which unfortunately still has not been filled. <laughs> despite many seemingly qualified folks who have applied and continue to apply and are motivated to help, um, but for various reasons are not getting through the system. Um, so I met with uh, folks from the governor's office to try to get more information and clarity on this. So um, I was basically warned again by Jacob Smith, the deputy, Dep deputy general counsel and assistant chief of staff at the governor's office that we have a quorum on our task force and we are bound by the legislation to keep working towards achieving our tasks and recommendations. I also received some insight at that meeting from Patina Park, uh, who is the executive director of tribal relations in the governor's office, um, that from her discussions with MIAC, the uh, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, that this was not high on their priority to find someone that represents all the Ojibwe tribes since they don't wanna be doing the government's work for them and have their own governments to run. She also was just frank with me that the topic of psychedelic medicine isn't a big priority to them. And she said many of them just aren't aware of what is happening in this front and thus aren't going to spend the time and energy to assist us on this. Uh, this sentiment is being echoed in other states that I've talked to where uh, local tribal nations do not want to be involved for a variety of reasons that I won't take up time at this meeting addressing. I do want to address a concern I have about the lack of transparency of the application review process and again, again the glaring fact that not a single one of these applicants has made it through for unknown reasons that I can't seem to get shared with me or the applicants. I pleaded with the governor's office to at least reach out to the applicants to let them know what the status is of their application and hopefully what in their application prevented them from being selected. So moving forward, I propose that we continue with our charge for the task force, but that we don't just sweep this issue under the rug either. Patina Park referenced that she is a lawyer as well and could be uh, could help with some perspective on tribal law and sovereignty and be a bridge with MIAC to do some outreach and education. And we can solicit subject matter experts from Ojibwe citizens in our state. Several have reached out to me directly wanting to help uh, to either speak to task force meetings or other working groups. So there are several members of the current legislature that are tribal citizens, so they could be tapped about this from the legislative perspective. And we can lean on Guthrie as our Dakota representative to at least have one voice at this virtual table. 
While this isn't ideal with regards to representation, other states have zero representation and engagement on this. So I'm hopeful we can do this work together and come up with recommendations that will benefit everyone in the state of Minnesota. So next, um, I wanna remind everyone that we have um, a fairly rich um, set of resources in our task force bookshelf. So this is up on the kind of upper left corner of Mural. Um, and so I encourage you to add items there, look at what has been put there um, and we can reference these um, and anything that you've put in or you wanna highlight for other members. So when we do the roll call, it would be helpful if, if anyone has put anything in there to kind of emphasize what's there um, to orient folks to review that. And Jessica, this is Stacy. Just want everybody to know I've summoned you. If you're on mural members, just straight to the bookshelf, so you are reminded exactly where it is. So, um, just wanted to let folks know that I was grabbing their screen. Thanks. All right. So next, I just want to give a brief update on public comments and feedback. So I've been receiving um, a lot of public comments and feedback through some listening sessions I've been hosting through the Psychedelic Society of Minnesota, Minnesota, sorry, not only to get public input and feedback and suggestions and have concerns voiced, but also to help platform and identify subject matter experts that the task force could tap. And it also serves to help with education of the public on this topic, which is one of our duties um, as a task force. And, and one thing that I consistently hear raised of just needing more education across the board about this topic. Um, so some of the consistent themes that I'm hearing from public, um, I'll briefly touch on these, but there are issues related to safety, um, access and, and you know, equitable access and affordability, concerns around spiritual and indigenous practices being appropriated and disrespected, general questions about why we are focusing on the three drugs we are, and uh, general questions about the legislative process. Um, and then a lot of comments about hope for using psychedelic medicines, and as well as I said before, the need for more education on this topic. Um, for time's sake, I don't wanna go into all the specific details around you know, what's in these themes. I think we can share these um, in our Google Drive so we can, as a task force, understand better what the public is saying. Um, I do wanna make a note because it does come up pretty frequently. Um, and the fact that we're not having adequate, you know, indigenous representation on the task force, um, this com com conflict of, of reverence for, these these things and there's this notion of biopiracy um, that's been brought up a lot with respect to plant medicines and um, we can talk about this but like biopiracy is defined as the unauthorized appropriation of knowledge and genetic resources of farming and in indigenous communities by individuals or institutions seeking exclusive monopoly control through patents or intellectual property and so you know I, I don't want to belabor this too much but um, this is a big issue in the psychedelic space in the medicalization of psychedelics and the medicalization of ritualistic practices and religious practices and belief. And um, I just wanna highlight something that was brought up at the Psychedelic Science Conference in 2023 in Denver, um, where during the closing remarks um, of the whole conference, there was a, a group of protesters that came up to this, the stage to really call this into our awareness as a collective field around um, some of the harms that have been done by taking different plant medicines and trying to push them through these systems. Um, and they referenced the examples of opium, coca and tobacco, which for a long time have been used medicinally, have um, a variety of uses in different indigenous cultures, but through our process of trying to extract out the active ingredients and commercialize them and mass produce them, they've actually turned into sources of disease. Um, and so they cautioned that we're following the same path with some of these psychedelics and to be respectful and mindful of that moving forward and to be consistently engaging and consulting with indigenous practitioners around um, the medicalization of their plant medicines and practices. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I do want to remind members um, that all of us are resources um, for public engagement. We all represent different sectors on the task force. And so I really would like to embolden all of you to go out into your respective communities and solicit feedback to bring back to the task force so we can discuss what the different sectors in our state want to prioritize as we're thinking about our recommendations for the task force. 
All right, so I'll leave it at that and now we'll move on to roll call. So if I can ask members to turn on your cameras, if that's possible for you, um, Stacy's gonna go around and call each of you. If you could please state what perspective you're representing, share any updates or information or articles of likely interest to the rest of the group. And then I do wanna allocate some extra time to Nick um, since he's our newest member to share more about himself via the intro box on mural. So if you wanna take that away, Stacy, for the roll call. Yep, I sure will. Here we go. Uh, Courtney Amundsen. Here representing integrative medicine. Um, I did put an article on the bookshelf. Um, Excellent. I, and yeah. just for the, the sake of the rest of the group, Courtney, was it pretty easy to just drag it and drop it right onto the bookshelf? Um, I actually just put a post-it and then I put a link in there. And I think that somebody might have gone and updated and fixed that for me. So whoever made it look much better than I did, I appreciate it, <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Helen Bassett. Good morning. Um, Helen Bassett here. And uh, just one quick note, uh, Jessica, if you could, the definition that you just described uh, from information, I think I certainly would like to, uh, you know, double back and share that with uh, the folks back at my office, so. Absolutely. It representing the Department of Commerce, thank you, the commissioner. So we'll have to think about where best to, to put that, if there's a place for it on mural or something, maybe Jessica, you and I can talk about that and let everybody know uh, when we have a moment. Does that sound good? Okay. Yes. All right, uh, Guthrie Capicella. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm here, I don't have, uh any resources at this time i uh, jessica i appreciate um the the lengthy update there and chrissy i appreciate your email it sounds like i've got some following up to do maybe i'll have some uh, resources and things to bring next time good morning oh uh representing dakota tribes in minnesota thank you senator julia coleman julia Good morning, everyone. I'm Julia Coleman. I'm representing the Minority Caucus from the Senate, and I bring perspective from Senate District 48, the eastern suburbs of Carver County. Thank you. Paula DeSanto. Hello, I'm representing uh, the treatment of substance use disorders, expertise in the field. Thank you. Jeremy Drucker. Uh, Jeremy Drucker, the Addiction Recovery Director for the State of Minnesota. I am um, uh, representing the uh, the governor's office, I believe, and um, I will send this around. There was a story in the New York Times this weekend about um, uh, sort of evolving notions of recovery that um, mentions um, psychedelic medicine um, as a potential therapy. So I can send that around. I think it offers some interesting context. Excellent. That's something that would be great on the bookshelf, Jeremy. So let me know if it'd be easier for you to just send it to me and I can make sure it gets there too. That's another option. And Stefan Egan. Uh, veteran with treatment resistant mental health conditions. And... Good to see you. And Dr. Mark Dr. Margaret Gavian. Good morning. Thank you, Jessica. I want to say just on all that uh, background and the work you're doing in between these meetings. Um, I'm a psychologist representing um, people with uh, treating people with treatment resistant conditions. Bennett Hertz. Hertz, excuse me. Good morning. I'm here on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General. Uh, David, and David, help me out again, because this is not locked in my head. Hong, right? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Good morning. This is Dave Hong, and I'm representing DHS. Thank you. And is Nick Leonard's here yet? I knew you were going to be late, but no, have no, you? Yeah, been, I rolled you? in. Yeah, hey, thanks, everybody. Right. This is Nicholas uh, Leonard's. Um, yeah, I, I'm the newest task force member. And uh, sorry, it's a little bit noisy here. Um, I just finished dropping my kids off at school and taking a clinical call. So um, I, I'm a, by training, I'm a physician and epidemiologist. Uh, I currently work at the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, prior to this, I, uh, I was uh, doing direct patient care up at the White Earth Reservation uh, as part of Indian Health Service. And then uh, before that, I, I worked inner city Baltimore. Um, my training is uh, in uh, primarily preventive medicine, um, which is sort of like the conflicts between sort of public health and direct patient care. And 
since I came to uh, Minnesota Department of Health, um, you know, I worked primarily as part of the COVID response. But uh, since that has sort of uh, stabilized, I, I work in other infectious disease uh, areas, including STDs and HIV, um, along with uh, continuing to work with uh, certain uh, populations, such as our Office of American Indian Health. And also I'm the medical director for the Office of Medical Cannabis. And so uh, really interested in the utilization of psychedelic medicine, uh, especially uh, with uh, treatment resistant mental conditions. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, to meeting you all and having this discussion. Really exciting. So thanks. Nick, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, and for the rest of the members, know that I grabbed your screen and pulled you up on Mural to a little bit more background information that Nick shared with us up in that opening section. So that was me grabbing your screen and I'll break the hold so you can go wherever you want to go now. But I thought you might appreciate seeing more about Nick there. Next up is Ari McHenry. Ari, are you here? Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Um, I'm a member with Public Health Policy Experience and want to echo the many um, thanks to Jessica for continuing to surface this idea about Indigenous representation here. And just to say that I did put in the bookshelf a paper from ICERS and IDPC. These are two um, international bodies that work on drug policy. And they have done some really great work around access to ancestral plants and um, the rights of indigenous peoples in the way that like international drug policy that has been exported from the West is really like in conflict with the human rights of these groups. So encourage folks to, um, to look at that and happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kelly Morrison, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Kelly Morrison. I represent the Senate uh, majority and Senate District 45, which is in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. And I am also an obstetrician gynecologist. Thank you, Dr. Jessica Nielsen. I think you're here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Jessica Nielsen. Um, I am the, let me read this out loud, the member with the mutual <laughs> experience in the medical use of psychedelic medicine. Um, I'm also the chairperson of this task force, and I put a bunch of stuff on your all. Um, so there's a lot of things for me regarding just kind of context around the, the space with psychedelics, um, links to lectures from the Psychedelic Science Conference. A lot of those are freely available. There's a lot of information around the science, cultural implications, indigenous representation, drug policy reform. It's a rich source of, of educational material for all of us and just a littered mural with various articles and I've also provided some uh, questions that we can build upon uh, for today's discussion on mural around some of the legal overview and regulatory things that we should be thinking about for the working groups um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Kat O'Neill. Good morning. I am one of the uh, representatives of patients with treatment resistant conditions. Thanks, Kit. Jill Phillips. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jill Phillips, and I am here representing the Board of Pharmacy. Thanks, Jill. Good to see you. Ken Sass. Is Ken here today? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. No, I think he may be gone. Is anybody else seeing him on the I don't see him. list? Okay, thanks. Uh, Representative Andy Smith. Hello, everybody. Great to be back in person. Watching these on replay is not as fun as being here. Uh, I represent the majority party in the House of Representatives, and I actively serve for District 25B, which is downtown Rochester and the surrounding areas. Glad to be here. Thank you. Michael Tabor. Morning. I'm the other veteran representative, and um, I do have some uh, a few articles that kind of explore the um, veteran angle, um, and including the federal right to try acts of all stats. Um, Thanks, Michael. Uh, Jessica, I think I might need to make space for another bookshelf. Ours is going to start uh, exploding pretty soon. So it's this is a wonderful problem to have. Uh, let's see. Adam Tomzik. Uh, good morning. I am a representative for patients with treatment-resistant mental illness, 
I'm glad to be here this morning. I did drop an article on the bookshelf, which was a profile of me by my undergrad university and specifically about how ketamine assisted psychotherapy was helpful for me dealing with mental health issues as well as substance abuse issues. So I, I put it in a sticky note. It doesn't look really pretty. I don't know if, I guess I don't know so how to better. make it look like a, a hyperlink or something like that, but it's on there. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll, fig we'll figure all that stuff out. That's not a problem you need to worry about. All right. Uh, Dr. Ranji Varghese. Ranji, are you here? Oh, I am you. here. There you go. Oh, hi. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Renji Verghese. I am a physician. I am a psychiatrist. I treat patients with treatment-resistant mental conditions. I'm familiar with the uh, psychedelic space, having done some research on it. Um, and I dropped a, an article on the bookshelf over the weekend regarding uh, California's attempt at legalizing psychedelics and its apparent failure, which was surprising to me. And we can discuss that at some point. Uh, Jessica, thanks for the uh, update. Welcome, Nick. And um, I really would love to provide some feedback on the um, feedback that I'm getting from my physician colleagues about the task force, having obviously not provided any details with these meetings. But uh, um, uh, it's great, Jessica, that we will have a venue to be able to share different perspectives. And lastly, it's my birthday. <laughs> Well, happy birthday. Happy birthday. That's Thank wonderful. You. I can't think of a better place to spend it than on a task force online. <laughs> Way to take one for the team. All right. Uh, last person on the roll call, Jessica, is Representative Nolan West, but he contacted us this morning. He was not able to make it today. So we have a, a rock star attendance here. Uh, we are good to go. Blast of the quorum right out of the water. Lovely. Thank you, everyone. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to approving uh, the meeting minutes. So hopefully all of you have reviewed the meeting minutes that were sent around last week. I do want to point out I did notice a few typos. They're not like substantial changes to the content. So I think we could still vote on whether to approve it unless anyone has any other issues or discrepancies or things that weren't um, reflected in the meeting minutes that we want to be adding. Um, so I do kind of want to open that up for discussion and see if anyone has any things they want to bring up to modify the minutes. Otherwise, we'll move on to a vote to approve the minutes from January. So we need a motion and a second to even get it open to discussion. So if you want to call for that first, that'd be great. I get a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second. This is Helen. Nice. We have a motion to approve the minutes. All right, so now you can open it for, up for discussion in case anybody else spotted anything out except those typos that need to be fixed. Yeah, so I'll just open up the floor if anyone has anything they want to address beyond kind of already highlighting some of the, some typos. Just I know my, I saw my name was misspelled, um, but that's an easy fix. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts about the meeting minutes they want to address. All right, hearing none. Going once, going twice. All right, well, I, I've got to do the roll call again. So if that's a, if you're ready for that, Jessica, yep. I'll go ahead and do that. And this time I'm using first names, and I'm going really fast. So keep your finger over your your microphone button. Here we go, Courtney. Um, yes. Helen. Yes. Guthrie. Uh, sorry, Guthrie. I missed the open comment portion of it can we add to the minutes that there's no Ojibwe representative on there and then I approve yeah I did see that Guthrie there so there's a section that says I said that we would likely have the seat filled by next month by now which we obviously don't so I think that yeah it needs um it wasn't filled in that seat so I think maybe some modification around the fact that it wasn't filled Correct. Not that so we anticipate that at the date of the meeting, the position had not been filled. Am I getting that right? Because we can't change it based on what we know now on this date to what would the reality was back then. So am I, am I getting that right? Yeah. Do you have any uh, recommendations, Guthrie, for how to phrase that? Um, 
just I, why don't we just say currently Ojibwe position not filled, uh, seeking uh, continue seeking guidance to fill seat, something like that. This is silence is just Stacy grabbing that. Okay. No um, problem. So. Well, well, I'll fill the silence and say also thank you. So the first report that was due to the legislator went out, and there is a whole paragraph on that problem. So I just want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Nielsen putting, as we put together the support to keep a highlight on that, so people know that that is not something that's just going away. Thank you, Reps. And thank you, Guthrie. Um, Stacy, does that sound good? And can we move forward with a vote to approve that with that amendment? Yep, but I'm going to go ahead and go back to the top of the list. We've got a motion and a second. We've got two small adjustments to the minutes from the dis no the January 2024 meeting. Um, and so I'm going to start at the top of the list again. Courtney. Yes. Helen. Yes. Guthrie. Yes. Julia. Yes. Paula? Yes. Jeremy? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Bennett? Apologies all for my absence last month. I was in trial. I will abstain. Ah. Thank you. David? Yes. Nick? Oh. Nick, you were not there, so I'm assuming you're going to abstain as well. I abstain, yes, that will be me too. Yep, yep. Maybe I Ari? should abstain as well. Sorry to interrupt, because so I wasn't here last month either. Hang on. Got it. Ari. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Kit. Yes. Jill. Yes. Ken? Ken Sass? He is not present. Oh, it's my mistake. Uh, Andy? Uh, sorry, I was not here last time, but I did watch a replay, so I feel comfortable voting yes. Michael. Yes. Adam. Yes. Ranji. Yes. And no one is absent. All right, motion to approve carried. We are ready to move on. Lovely. Jessica, Thank you, you want to set the stage for the next item? Absolutely. So um, now we're going to do an update on surveying the scientific literature. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Caroline, who's going to go ahead and um, give us a brief overview of identified health conditions for each drug and a brief discussion of the indigenous research results. Uh, take it away, Caroline. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, first, I want to preemptively apologize. I've been having some tech issues this morning. So if I drop off, that's the reason and I will be back. Um, but to get started, so um, after last month's meeting, I ran the searches for question one, which was the identification of our health conditions. And today I'll give you a high level overview in 10 quick minutes of the results. Um, I'll also discuss the Journal of Indigenous Research and um, I'll end with a timeline of the rest of the literature review. Uh, next slide, please. So the results from the PubMed search are in this table. Using the parameters that we agreed on during the last meeting, I ran the search for each drug through the database. And the top row here tells you the number of results returned in the search for each drug and then the total. After the search, I put the results into a spreadsheet and I reviewed each one to determine if it fit our criteria for inclusion. And this is the middle row. Uh, many of these results were systemic reviews or meta-analyses, so I went in and further narrowed down the results to highlight the primary studies um, that have provided first-hand data, and this is the bottom row, um, because I wanted to give everyone an idea of the state of the research. And so the details of the searches and an overview 
are all on the Google Drive, uh, which everyone should have access to now. I also want to note I've uploaded some open access research papers if anyone is interested in those. Uh, because the initial question was just the identification of the conditions, I won't be discussing individual studies in depth today, but that will come as the research progresses. Um, so in the next section, I'll give an overview of the conditions by drug. Um, but before we actually really move on, uh, I want to take a moment to address some points. Um, and the first is that these psychedelic drugs have been investigated in a drug-assisted therapy model when the condition is a mental health condition, rather than something one might get and take home or otherwise take unsupervised. In the rest of the presentation, when I say you know, the drug might be used to treat a mental health condition, uh, just know that that means drug plus psychotherapy. And second, all of the following results are those that have already been published in peer-reviewed journals. Registered, currently active, or complete but unpublished clinical trials for any other health conditions aren't included based on task force votes last month. Um, but keep in mind then that there's the potential for this list to expand down the line. Um, so we can move on to the next slide now. So I will start with LSD. Um, and one quick note, I've included the number of primary studies for each condition, just as a way to get some context to the results. So for LSD, the, health, the identified health conditions include depression and anxiety, mainly anxiety, with or without a life-threatening illness, as well as for existential dread or palliative care. And the first two bullet points are all phase two clinical trials. LSD has also been identified to help treat substance use disorders, um, particularly alcohol and narcotic use disorders. Uh, but do note now the term narcotic is actually out of date, um, and narcotic really just refers to opioids now. LSD may help treat cluster headaches, um, and one study from the 1960s identified the drug as a potential analgesic agent for pain management. Finally, two more studies from the 60s identified LSD as a potential treatment for schizophrenia. Um, but I want to caution that there have been no modern follow-ups for schizophrenia that fit our criteria for our question two, which is the in-depth investigation into these drugs. And so it likely will not end up in the report for that question. We can move on to the next slide. For psilocybin, the identified health conditions include uh, major depressive disorder, including treatment-resistant depression, and anxiety, again, with or without a life-threatening illness. Um, and within these top two bullet points, eight of the studies are phase two clinical trials and two are phase one. Psilocybin may also be used to treat bipolar type 2 disorder, um, as well as compulsive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Psilocybin has also shown potential as a treatment for substance use disorders, including alcohol and tobacco use disorders. And I'd like to again remind you here that these results just come from studies that are already published in peer review journals. And so this list, particularly in substance use disorders, may expand in the future. Uh, the next health conditions identified that psilocybin may help treat are cluster headaches and migraines. And finally, psilocybin may help treat anorexia nervosa. This has been explored in a phase one clinical trial, but was not a randomized controlled trial, and therefore may not make it into the report on question two, since last month we decided that RCTs are a requirement for our question two. Uh, next slide. For MDMA, the identified health conditions include post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as specific symptoms within PTSD, uh, which are alcohol use and eating disorders. Within the whole PTSD group, three of these studies are phase three clinical trials and seven are phase two. MDMA may also help treat specific anxiety disorders, namely social anxiety in autistic adults and anxiety in response to a life-threatening illness. Um, and all of these are phase two clinical trials. Finally, one study identified tinnitus as potentially being treatable with MDMA. 
As a reminder, again, the details for all of this, as well as an overview, um, that's all in the Google Drive if you're interested um, and want to take a look. So we can move on to the next slide. Uh, so the next, the next thing I'd like to bring up is the Journal of Indigenous Research. If you recall from the list of journals that we found, only this one met the criteria for inclusion in our review. Uh, when I ran the searches for each drug, there were no results returned for any of them. And this prompted us to bring forward some thoughts on different and more appropriate ways to include Indigenous knowledge in our report. Uh, because ultimately, it's not our goal to sterilize this use in knowledge, nor do we want to exclude it because it isn't the narrow definition of clinical medicine. And I say this also because we want to make sure that any research or work we're doing around Indigenous cultures is approached through the six R's Indigenous framework, which is listed here. Um, and so fitting this knowledge in with the scientific literature review might not be the most appropriate place for it. And related to this, Oregon created a separate cultural and anthropological review around Indigenous youth and culture. And since we've identified a similar gap in our work process, we think that evaluating these cultural considerations might be something that the work group can discuss and incorporate uh, into their work plans. We don't have time remaining in this particular section um, today to discuss this at length right now, but we wanted to bring it forward um, as a task force and a work group consideration. Um, okay, next slide, please. So finally, Circling back to the clinical science, uh, I wanted to give you a timeline of what's next um, and when you might expect to have specific answers. Uh, keep in mind, the, the work might go a little faster or slower than presented here as I really start digging into it. Uh, but by the end of the month, I will have a draft of the narrative for question one finished. And then now through March, I will run the search for question two, which is the comparison of treatments and question three, which is the risk of treatment, um, or the risks within treatment for LSD. And I will do the analyses, I'll draft a narrative around those results, um, and then March through April, May-ish, I will do the same for psilocybin, and then May through you know, June, July-ish, I will repeat it for MDMA. After that, um, I'll run a quick search just to see if any new papers for any of the drugs have been published that we should include. And then after that, it's you know, various stages of writing, editing, formatting. Um, as we get closer to the end, I imagine the September through December portions may change based on how the task force is moving. But this is kind of um, an overview of when you might expect to have in-depth scientific and risk-related results. Um, and so, with that, I'm finished. Uh, as always, thank you so much for your time. Um, and if you have any specific questions that you think of now or in the future, you can either leave them directly in the mural um, or you know, feel free to email me with those questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, can you just for uh, purposes for all members remind them where on mural these slides are that they could put some comments on? Oh, absolutely. So it will be in section one of the fourth, um, the, the bottom most area in mural. And I think, oh yeah, Jess is taking us there now. The mural area one, there's a big and a bunch of sticky notes that you can feel free to include your comments on. Lovely, thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to transition into the first half of our legal overview presentation, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll have an additional discussion after the break. Um, so um, I want to, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our presenter, Dr. Mason Marks. He's both a medical doctor and a lawyer. He has an MD and a JD degree, is a visiting professor of law at Harvard Law School. Dr. Marks is the Florida Bar Health Law Section Professor at the Florida State University College of Law, and at Harvard Law School, he is the Senior Fellow and Lead of the Project on Psychedelics Law and Regulation, which he co-founded at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics in 2021. 
Professor Marks is also a visiting fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. So Dr. Marks reached out to me back in December, uh, wanting to help support the work of the task force. And he has been very, from my perspective, instrumental in some of the legislation passed, I believe, in Oregon, um, as well as working on other legislative initiatives um, in other states. Um, and recently presented and was on a panel for the FDA around trying to figure out how to get psychedelic medicines FDA approved and implemented. So with that, I'll turn it over to our guest, Mason Marks, to go over some of the legal challenges that we're facing in the realities of federal and state uh, legal landscapes around psychedelic medicine. So thank you so much, Mason, if you wanna go ahead and um, come on camera and, and begin your presentation. Thank, you, thank you. Can you see me okay? I do have my camera on. Can you see me uh, all right? Great. Well, thanks for having me. I I should say um, up front as an attorney that anything I say here is not legal advice. I'm just offering technical information. And um, there, anything I say is also my own opinion, doesn't re reflect my employers or, or uh, the beliefs of anyone else. Uh, and I'm also not advocating for any specific action that you take, but kind of want to lay out uh, the different possibilities and some of the legal implications. Uh, I was involved in the Oregon rulemaking. I was a member of the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board, and I chaired the licensing subcommittee. So we made a lot of the rules around licensing facilities and facilitators and um, things like in the informed consent document and um, ethical code, client bill of rights, things like that. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out was, was uh, and I enjoyed that presentation by Dr. Johnson about the, the medical um, data, and I just wanted to point out that the, um, the separate sort of cultural review uh, was something that was proposed but was ultimately not pursued, uh, and I was involved in making that proposal, but there, there turned out to be a lack of interest and support for it in the end. So um, one criticism of the Oregon scientific review um, was that it did not include those perspectives. The, though looking at your mandate and the Oregon mandate, um, the Oregon's mandate was a little broader. It, it said to include other information. And so that, you know, that likely encompassed the, uh, the um, non, non Western scientific viewpoints, but I just wanted to point that out. And, and then also, oh yeah, just real quick. Yeah, I just, I forgot to make a brief announcement before you started talking just to, to our members, to the task force members. Um, so we have a bunch of prompts on mural in section two uh, for this month's content. So if you follow Stacy, you'll get oriented there. And so we have some kind of predefined questions around some of the legal parameters we might pursue um, that, that potentially will be covered uh, by Dr. Marks. And so just as you're listening to his presentation, and thoughts around this, um, go ahead and review some of those things and pop in any questions that you might have around some of these things. And thank you, sorry for the yeah, interruption. Please. Oh no, please do uh, feel free to jump in. And I was going to say that, you know, you gave me a very generous amount of time to speak and I'm, I'm really going to err on the side of not speaking for very long because I, I, you know, this is a really complicated area and I think it's good to have more of an interactive discussion. Um, one other thing I wanted to raise is that um, I, you know, there's a there's a big debate right now in the scientific community about whether to call what what the FDA is approving a psychedelic therapy, and, and a lot of debate over that term, because if you really dig into the trials, um, usually what it, what the, the psychological support, which is a, kind of an alternative term, is does not look like what you would consider to be. Uh, traditional psychotherapy. It's usually more of a monitoring type situation. And even it's often even advised not to engage in what you might think of as psychotherapy. So just another sort of complication to think about, because that can come up in, in any rules that you make uh, regarding what kind of support can be offered. Um, so let me just start with a little bit of background and say that a lot of this, um, a lot of what I'm going to say is sort of theoretical. Um, it's based on legal precedent. A, a lot of it's based on experience with cannabis regulation, cannabis law. Uh, but when we talk about psychedelics, a lot of this really is uncharted territory. And, and you know, even though Oregon was the first to, to really uh, wade into this, you, you are very much on the front lines. Um, and a lot of what you do 
will involve a lot of you know, some degree of speculation and risk. Uh, but just as some general background, um, I know one of your questions is to consider the degree to which different approaches you might take could conflict with federal law. And so I think that's a good place to start. Uh, we, we need to talk a little bit about the, the concept of preemption when federal law preempts state law and constrains what states can do. And constitutionally, federal law is the supreme law of the land that, that gives Congress the ability to uh, preempt an entire field, an entire area. So one can ask, well, has Congress done that with respect to drug law? Has Congress said that we're, we're preempting the entire field of drug law? No, not, not in this case. Um, but it's a little unclear exactly the extent to which federal law does preempt state law. So it's kind of a, a common answer in law, which is not very satisfying, which is it, it depends. It's, it's gonna be um, fact specific. So the question is not so much um, usually does a state drug regulatory system for cannabis, for example, or psychedelics conflict with federal law, it usually will. The question is really how much and uh, does, it, does it conflict so much that it becomes a problem and there, and there could be some kind of federal intervention. So one principle that's helpful to understand is called the anti-commandeering rule. This is a sort of a Supreme Court uh, a doctrine or rule that effectively says that the, the federal government can't force states to enforce federal law. So uh, the, the federal government could uh, require a system for regulation of drugs, but can't force the states or state um, agencies or agents to enforce that, that federal law. Uh, and then we get into the question of conflict. So um, since Congress has not preempted that field, uh, what happens then is you look, to look at the text of the Controlled Substances Act, for example, and say, well, how, well, what areas are preempted and what are not? It's not entirely clear. It's not 100% clear. And there are a couple ways that a state law can conflict with federal law. One is by making it impossible to comply with the state and federal law. So an example of that would be if you, as, as a state, created a, a law that required the government to give people psilocybin mushrooms. It would be impossible to comply with that state law and the federal law. But most state regulation of cannabis, for example, falls short of that. And that falls into the second category of conflict with federal law which is obstructing uh, the, a primary purpose or an important purpose that Congress had in mind when enacting the law. So when it comes to um, the, the Controlled Substances Act, it's targeted at reducing uh, illicit drug use, reducing trafficking, things like that. So if a state law obstructs achieving that objective, that could Imp that that would impermissibly conflict with federal law, and it's all a, it's it's all a matter of degree. So I think it's helpful to think about different approaches that have been taken so far by states regarding psychedelics, as well as cannabis. And so I want to start with the cannabis situation. And so let's think about medical cannabis regulation by states. Typically. Um, that might involve some very minimal um, licensing of or, or sort of uh, uh, certification of healthcare providers to be able to certify patients to receive medical cannabis. It might require registration of patients. And um, there's very little beyond that, there's really very little involvement of healthcare professionals in medical cannabis programs. So doctors aren't handling medical cannabis. They're not, um, we don't even use the word prescription. It's called a recommendation. And patients don't typically, typically go to a pharmacy to get their medical cannabis. They go to a, a dispensary that lies outside the conventional healthcare system. So there's really very little involvement of the healthcare system or healthcare professionals. They, they really deal with medical cannabis at a distance. And that looks very different 
from what many states are doing when it comes to psychedelics. And so Oregon is the first program. It's a great example to look at. And as you probably know, it requires psilocybin and, and it only regulates psilocybin, not other psychedelics, but it requires psilocybin to be administered at licensed facilities called service centers. And then a licensed facilitator who may or may not be a healthcare professional will monitor the clients for the five or six hours that it takes for the duration of the of the psilocybin experience. So this is very different from medical cannabis where healthcare professionals like doctors, like therapists, like social workers, other professionals have little or no involvement. They're, they're much more deeply involved. They're in the room with the controlled substance. Uh, they're monitoring people. So there's a lot more overlap with the healthcare system. Still, Oregon is really unique and notable because it has some limitations that are very clear legal restrictions that really create boundaries between the healthcare system and the psilocybin program. And some of those are uh, regarding medical claims. These licensed facilita facilitators cannot make medical claims regarding psilocybin, nor can the service centers. The facilitators can't diagnose or treat health conditions. And uh, if they do have healthcare licenses, like a physician's license, they can't exercise the privileges of that license when acting as a psilocybin facilitator. So they sort of have to take off their healthcare professional hat and put on the facilitator hat. And um, there are exceptions, of course, for emergency situations where someone's health is in danger. But for the most part, um, uh, you can't you cannot uh, deliver health care. And these centers, the service centers, cannot operate within a licensed health care facility. So legally, you can't operate a licensed, uh, a licensed service center in a, um, a palliative care center or a hospice or a nursing home, uh, things like that. Um, still, there are people you know, and organizations in Oregon that do promote the program as being medical. They may say on their website, for example, that, you know, come, come uh, treat your addiction with our psilocybin services. And um, another interesting thing to note about Oregon so far is that there, it, it, the, the program has served an estimated you know, six to 900 people so far. And most of those people apparently have come from out of state. Uh, so this, the, the promise of that program to deliver mental health care to Oregonians may not um, be being fulfilled. It's become more of a tourist destination for people to come and, and utilize those services. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And we can get into the reasons for that. Part of it is that the, uh, the, the licenses are so expensive. It's $10,000 for most service centers per year. And for the facilitators, it's $2,000 per year. And I always compare that to my law license in California, which I just renewed. That was about $450, $500 per year. So it's a lot more expensive to have a facilitator's license in Oregon. And then you also have the tax implications uh, for businesses. And so you end up having many fewer psilocybin related businesses than you do cannabis dispensaries. Oregon has hundreds of cannabis dispensaries. And I believe right now they have 21 psilocybin service centers. And so the program doesn't generate enough revenue to sustain itself. Um, so that's another sort of the, the, the financial viability and sustainability of the program is another issue. But then compare that program to Colorado's program, which is, is still in the planning stages, the rulemaking stages and should open next year in 2025. That program doesn't have any of the limitations that Oregon does when it comes to medical, you know, blending healthcare with psychedelics. And as you probably know, it, it regulates potentially many more psychedelics, so five different substances, as opposed to just one or technically two, psilocybin and psilocin in Oregon. But it, in Colorado, um, the, the facilitators can make, there's no limitation on them making health claims. The healing centers, which is the equivalent of the service centers in Oregon, can be located in a licensed healthcare facility. 
And uh, the advisory board there recently made the recommendation that those healing centers actually be designated healthcare facilities under the under Colorado law. So it's really kind of the opposite of Oregon. And then there's no limitation on diagnosing or treating health conditions um, or, or utilizing your healthcare license. <clears throat> so one thing I just want to impress on you is that these are not the only options available. Uh, just you know, copying Oregon's program, copying Colorado's program. There are many, many other options. Uh, decriminalization is one of them. That's one that the Colorado law includes. So in addition to the regulated supervised program, their uh, uh, personal use has been uh, decriminalized or the, the um, criminal penalties significantly reduced. Uh, and that, that's an important distinction. I always like to draw a distinction between decriminalization and legalization. Um, when I logged on, someone referred to the, uh, the California bill, SB 58, as, as le potentially legalizing psychedelics. And I would say, and, and many other people, though not everyone, would say that that was a decriminaliza decriminalization bill. And the reason that's important is, is it gets into this idea of conflicts with federal law. Um, many people in drug law and policy think of, of um, decriminalization as a state stepping back and saying, we're not, we're not doing anything. We're not, we're not um, enforcing drug laws. And that's where that anti-commandeering principle comes into play. It's sort of taking no action as opposed to taking uh, the action that comes along with legalization, which I typically think of as creating a, a system for, re for manufacturing, uh, uh, distribution, sales, things like that, uh, which is taking a positive action, which um, depending on the action you take, so it could, it could be along a spectrum from just issuing permits to consumers and uh, or, or maybe uh, which which might allow them to to grow or or sell uh, to um, these very elaborate programs that you see in Oregon and, and Colorado. Uh, moving along that continuum, more and more uh, potential state involvement, more complex regulation can potentially conflict more with federal law. And I sent you that uh, letter from December from the DEA to Oregon pharmacies regarding dispensing cannabis. Georgia is unusual in the US in that it's pharmacies that, that pharmacies can dispense medical cannabis. And so that is a, is a similar example of blending uh, traditional conventional health, no, I shouldn't say traditional, conventional healthcare, conventional Western healthcare with um, uh, a controlled substance, a schedule one controlled substance in a way that most states don't. And something about that crossed the threshold to trigger that letter from the DEA. So I would keep that in mind when, when you're thinking about recommendations that, that may uh, similarly cross that threshold and trigger not only a potential response from, from DEA, but other federal agencies. Uh, once uh, companies start making health claims like they will in Colorado, uh, they, can, uh, they may face intervention from FDA and also the, uh, the, the, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, which both regulate, um, uh, can regulate claims made about uh, products. And, and they have cracked down in some ways on medical claims made about other substances like kratom, uh, cannabis related products, uh, stem cell treatments, things like that. So there is a general assumption in, among many people in Oregon and Colorado that from the perspective of federal law and, the, and federal agencies, psychedelics will be treated very similarly to the way that cannabis has been treated in the past. I, I am not convinced that's a, a safe assumption to make because these programs look very different than cannabis. And also uh, they're viewed very differently politically. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of political will to change the law regarding cannabis that is uh, reflected in, in, uh, on the international stage that has been accumulating for decades. You know, Canada uh, has legalized um, uh, marijuana 
and uh, many you know other countries have have done so, or are, or at least not enforcing their criminal laws. So that we don't have that background with psychedelics. And, you know, if you're looking, if you're thinking about the um, sort of political climate and landscape, psychedelics are much farther behind. Uh, cannabis and also in a lot of these state laws you're talking about multiple substances you're not just talking about one like cannabis uh, in many states or psilocybin in in Oregon so that complicates things a lot too because as you know they they are very different things like ibogaine are going to be very different from from psilocybin so I think the last thing I'll say before I open it up for for discussion is that there are other options available. You know, one option in, in addition to decriminalizing is to uh, regulate just like cannabis. That is an option. And in, in many ways that would, uh, would likely conflict less with federal law. There are variations on that, such as uh, requiring consumers to undergo some kind of training or education in order to be permitted to purchase a cannabis, a, a psychedelic like psilocybin, or uh, I sent you a law, a proposed law from Massachusetts from Representative Boldaiga, and that um, creates a much a very simplified version of what Oregon has done, uh, where there is a, it, it specifies a, a, a license fee, it's much lower, it's $150 as opposed to uh, the 2000 I think it's paid every two years and uh, there's no requirement that, so that it, it really emphasizes training the facilitator and regulating, regulating the facilitator instead of requiring the experiences to occur at a specific facility. And that's where a lot of the cost comes and, 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 and is what is making Oregon and, and very likely soon Colorado cost prohibitive. And, and arguably unsustainable, but uh, regulating those facilities can also result in a, in a state program conflicting more with federal law. So these are some things that I would think about uh, focusing on the, the uh, professionals rather than specific facilities is one way to potentially go. And um, oftentimes a lot of the, the rhetoric used in um, campaigns to enact these laws in states is that we're not talking about cannabis. Uh, we're not talking about dispensaries. Uh, this is something totally different. This looks a lot more like, like uh, medical care. Um, that, may or, that may or may not be good, um, both when it comes to safety, um, but when it comes to the legality, what I'm talking about, it certainly makes a difference or, or can make a difference. And um, that aspect of it is often overlooked. So hopefully, especially given your state's mandate, when it does come time for someone to draft a potential legislation, it would, it, it, it would be people who are you know, familiar with these, these uh, the relationships between state and federal law. Um, what ends up happening a lot of times is the people who draft psychedelic legislation are very familiar with cannabis, very familiar with cannabis licensing. A lot of the language gets copied over, you know, additional requirements get tacked on, uh, but they might not have a sort of broader understanding. Uh, and I think that is a, a really interesting feature of your task force or your, your group is to consider these legal implications, which uh, so far other states have, have not, um, not really done. And I think that is to your benefit uh, because if there was some kind of federal intervention, it, it may, they may be the primary um, targets of those interventions uh, if, if, uh, if Minnesota happened to have a system that was, you know, le because it's taken those conflicts into consideration and may, may have a system that conflicts less. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Marks. Um, so I have a bunch of questions, but I want to make sure that other folks on the task force have an opportunity to. So either raise your hand or, um, yeah, we'll do that. Okay. So we've got a good cue going. So we'll start with Adam and then Renji and then Ari. So go ahead, Adam. Thank you so much, doctor, for all of your work on this and for speaking with us today. I really, really appreciate it. I read two of your articles, um, 
that you, you probably provided to us and focused largely on FDA collision course issues. But what's happening with the DEA? Uh, you just mentioned briefly the Georgia DEA letter regarding THC. Has the DEA made any indication that it's going to like crack down on state psychedelic you know, laboratories or research programs? It's a great question, and I think it's anyone's guess. Uh, my understanding is that federal agencies don't have a lot of incentive to really t you know, telegraph their intent or even discuss these things. And, and, and you have to keep in mind that the Oregon program just opened months ago. It was just last summer. So it's been you know, a little over half a year that it's been open. So it's a little early to say exactly what the response might be. There haven't been any, um, you know, incidents that anyone's aware of, and I'm not aware of the, the DEA or or really any other federal agency except maybe NIDA. Um, I, I know that NIDA, National Institutes on Drug Abuse, is interested in in tracking what's happening in states, but you know they 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 wouldn't be the ones enforcing um, anything. Um, so I think it really depends. It's, it's anyone's guess. I think the, the, the Georgia letter from DEA is, is interesting and revealing. It, it suggests that perhaps the DEA is not quite as uninterested as many people assumed with cannabis, but we know even less when, when we're talking about psychedelics. And, um, if you were to ask them their standpoint and they actually provided a perspective, I, I can't possibly see them saying anything else other than this is strictly prohibited. Uh, but I don't think, you know, it's, I don't think they've really been engaged in, in the conversation. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so we'll go with Renji, then Ari, then Rep Smith, then Guthrie. Go ahead, Renji. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Marks, for your insightful contributions and perspectives to this task force and being here. Um, uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is something that you actually mentioned as you uh, towards the end there was that while we can draw some parallels between uh, cannabis and psychedelics, it's really important for this task force to recognize their distinct implications and, and differences, particularly concerning the potential for uh, medical complications in patients that, or as I say patients, I'm saying individuals that may have underlying um uh, psychiatric conditions that could exacerbate uh, with um, uh, psychedelic, at least the classical psychedelic medicines compared to, let's say, uh, cannabis. So uh, my concerns, of course, as a physician is this necessitates a rigorous screening process to mitigate risks. So I'm not sure whether Colorado and Oregon have um, really looked into, I'm, I'm curious how they sort of approach that and what you know, specific measures they implemented to prevent uh, adverse outcomes. And I'm glad to hear that uh, you know, Oregon so far has not had that. But should an unfortunate event occur under the uh, care of, of either licensed or unlicensed mental health professional or sitters in these particular states, what language uh, or who bears the responsibility of something catastrophic happens? um to these individuals who's, who's who's sort of on the hook i don't want to make it seem litigious but i want to make sure that at first and foremost people that are would gain access to this will is is safeguarded and that that's part of the 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 um task of this task force those are all great points i can tell you a little bit about how um, oregon has handled the screening I can't say how Colorado has because they don't have rules yet, but I've seen, you know, I've, I've attended the meetings of the advisory board there, so I can give you some idea of what they're planning. And they certainly do appear to have in mind a much more robust screening process. <clears throat> I would say that the Oregon process is, um, it tends toward on the lighter side, there's only one absolute in, uh, contraindication, which is, I think it's uh, having taken lithium in the past 30 days. And then there are other um, indications for which it would be strongly encouraged that someone um, you know, seek medical input first, but they're not absolute contraindications. But my impression from Colorado is that they'll have a, a much more robust screening 
Um, I don't, I don't know whether that is, is good or bad. I think there is some concern that the more complicated one makes things, the more potential there is to push people just to not go to these centers in the first place. Um, and I, and I would keep in mind that you, you are talking about a schedule one controlled substance when Oregon was looking at this, the Oregon Health Authority did publish a letter that um, extensive data collection could impact marginalized communities and more than, than others and, and deter them from participating in the program. Um, I think that's true. I also think that, you know, I don't know, I'm not that familiar with, with um, Minnesota cannabis law, but um, we don't have, there's typically not a lot of screening necessarily. Um, and so I don't know, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but I also would sort of compare the two. Um, but anyway, it's, a, it's an important point you raise. And I would just say that um, I think in balancing those interests, Oregon came up with something that was a little bit on the lighter side and really focusing, because there aren't that many contraindications you can point to and say these are absolute. It's just, you know, I think people talk about things like a family history of suicidal ideation. I think that's really taking it way too far. Um, or even having had suicidal ideation in the past, um, you know, at, at that point, you're eliminating a large percentage potentially of people who might benefit. And, and, and um, someone on that Oregon board said, well, you would exclude me from that, um, that you know, even be, being able to access that if you did this. So um, I thought that was an interesting comment from them. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks, Mason. I do want to be mindful of time. We're due for a 10 minute break if you're available to come back after the 10 minute break. Um, and then we can get to the remaining questions from Ari, uh, Rep. Smith, Guthrie, and Paula. And I do know that um, Jess or Stacy wanted to come on camera to give um, a little bit of housekeeping <laughs> notes about uh, the meeting today. And then we'll take a 10 minute break and come back at 11 o'clock Central Time. Perfect. I'll do those housekeeping things right when we get back. How's that sound, Jessica? Okay. Sounds good. All right. So we'll come back. All right. This is Jess. Can I do one quick housekeeping thing? Sure. I've had some uh, tech issues and I'm going to reload my browser and I hope that doesn't end the meeting and kick people out, but it's possible. So uh, if it does, I apologize that you have to come back in, um, but hopefully that'll fix my issues. And I'm going to do Very it good. the break. Thank you. All right, we'll see you it all at 11 o'clock. It looks like the meeting did not break while I was gone or while I refreshed. I think we're good. Can you see me? Uh, uh, let me check. It shows my camera's on. I can see you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't see myself, which is fine. And members, if you're within the sound of my voice, know that we'll begin again in two minutes. All right, folks, this is Jessica's voice here. Uh, just want to call folks back to uh, the Zoom meeting. Uh, come back on camera if, camera if you're able. So we have 20 minutes for this next section. Um, I do want to get through the last four questions that we have queued up from Ari, then Rep Smith, then Guthrie, and then Paula. And then we're going to head over to Mural to do some more work around some of the more specific questions we have posed in there around some of the, 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 the federal landscape and how to navigate that. Um, so uh, Mason, if you wanna come back on and we'll get started with the next round of questions. Um, uh, are you back online? Maybe? Yeah, I'm here, yeah. Great. All right, so Ari, do you wanna go ahead and um, ask your question? Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciating this. Um, so my background is as a public health policy person. I work a lot on um, opioid drug policy, harm reduction, that sort of thing. So I'm curious, because 
I don't disagree with anything that you're saying, but I do want to push back on this question of like DEA's appetite to um, like warn the states about what they're doing and less about DEA because I think in some ways they're like a little bit like doing their own thing. Like they're maybe perhaps more litigious than the White House is or the Office of National Drug Control Policy because I see those bodies being quite hands off when it comes to the states, you know, like innovating around drug policy. I see safe consumption sites opening in New York City and operating without conflict. Like I see Rhode Island about to open a state uh, sanctioned safe consumption site. So, you know, you're talking about how can we shouldn't use what's happening with cannabis as necessarily a model for psychedelics. And I agree with what you're saying, but I also think that the last few decades with cannabis liberalization have opened the door for the federal government to be more open to like decriminalization type approaches, legalization type approaches than they might have been. So I'm just, yeah, I guess I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious. How does that land with you? Well, um, there's no guarantees, you know, if, if, if a state wants to gamble its money on what the federal government may or may not do, it of course can. I think there are some significant differences between cannabis and psychedelics. There is not a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry when it comes to cannabis as there is with psychedelics. And so in, in Colorado, this is a very realistic scenario where in a few years, if FDA approved psilocybin, you could have FDA approved psilocybin being offered in the same office as state regulated psilocybin one being, you know, having gone through clinical trials and uh, being FDA approved, the other, um, and also being synthetic, the other coming from fungi and, uh, and not being FDA approved. And um, I think those are, that, that creates a very different climate to ask that question about potential federal uh, intervention. And I, I, I agree that, you know, it's not, it's not guaranteed. It may not even be likely. I mean, there are limited federal resources. Um, that's one reason though, why I think that states that are, if they are in much clearer conflict with federal law, they might be more likely to draw that attention. Um, you know, maybe the letter sent to Georgia pharmacists is purely, it's all bark, you know, and they're not going to do anything about it. You know, who knows? I don't know. I, no one really knows. Um, but, you know, I think, these are the kinds of questions that you've been asked to consider and I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know, but, um, there are other things to consider as well. I mean, there's issues like, um, international treaties and what the effects might be. Um, you know, there's kind of growing momentum to maybe apply different standards to cannabis. I don't know whether there's, and, and so that may play into any federal decision. If, the, if, if, if the federal government starts to think that state programs are starting to impact compliance with federal tre with international treaties, it could have it could that could also be another factor that affects these things, because international sentiment towards cannabis has changed significantly, but not necessarily towards psychedelics. So that's another like potential difference. There's just so many unknowns. I don't disagree with you necessarily, but you know, we just we're predicting. Thanks. All right, Rep Smith, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. March, for being here, especially as someone who's potentially going to write legislation on this in the near future. I really appreciate this. One thing um, that you did not touch on specifically here that you did touch on in uh, this letter to the Journal for the American Medical Association is specifically how uh, federal Medicaid is potentially another uh, huge weapon, so to speak, that the federal government would have against this. Um, I think it's really important, obviously, that those who are on Medicaid programs or those that receive Medicaid funding in any form would have access to these sort of things if we were going to um, legalize and make them available in these contexts. In your interaction, both with Colorado and Oregon or just your own um, view of the law, are there ways around this besides the federal government um, Descheduling these, what are what are some potential fixes where, uh, you know, Medicaid funding could be used for these things without it becoming 
potentially something where people could lose licensing or funding, uh, both facilities, practitioners, and patients? That's another great question. I don't think there is a way to get around that. I, you're not, you know, you're, and uh, this came up in Colorado. Uh, the advisory board there was pushing um, for an interpretation of the Colorado law to almost require, to create rules to require the state Medicaid uh, health, health first or health Colorado to pay for certain aspects. Um, but what I've learned is that um, that organization, the state Medicaid says that's not going to happen. Uh, and facilities that receive funding from those federal programs don't, they don't allow cannabis anywhere near the facilities. And the same will be true of psychedelics. Uh, that's been said many times in Colorado, but um, like I said earlier, they're, they're still attempting to designate those centers as licensed healthcare facilities and that qu hasn't quite set in. I think the way to address that issue is to think of systemic ways to reduce the cost rather than sort of uh, reducing the cost after the fact. So what's happened is we create this really expensive, burdensome regulation, which has other effects of driving people underground. But then you also then then you come back and say, well, how do we band aid this problem by creating like funding for certain patient populations? Um, you know, kind of looking at the looking at what you've created this monstrosity and saying now how can we make it cheaper? You know, so I think that should be a, a consideration in the in the beginning at step one when you start um, designing a program. But I don't think there's any way around that. Um, the way that cannabis programs in some states get around it is if a patient goes to a doctor to get the certification, um, as long as the certification for medical marijuana is a small part of the overall visit, it's just a general checkup or visit, they might be able to bill you know, Medicaid for that um, overall visit. But um, it, differ it kind of differs from state to state. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I do want to be mindful of time. We do actually have an extra 15 minutes allocated in general for this meeting. So if we go over a little bit, um, cause I do want to give us time to go on mural, but, um, I want to give Guthrie and Paula their chance to ask their questions and then we'll head over to some of the questions on mural. Go ahead, Guthrie. Thanks, Dr. Nielsen. Uh, Dr. Marks, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, kind of similar to what, uh, representative Smith was just asking. Um, I'm, uh, uh, here designated from the Dakota tribes, um, one of two positions uh, dedicated towards tribes um, on this task force. Um, so uh, my questions are going to be really kind of put into that ballpark, but but where the overlapping issues come up is, you know, um, so I've got three questions. I'll try to sum them up into one thing for you. Um, you. You talked about the relationship between state and federal. I have questions sort of surrounding the, the relationships between state, federal, and tribal. Um, and specifically, you know, kind of as, as he was talking about with the Medicaid, Medicare issue, have you seen anything come up from the Indian Health Service or Bureau of Indian Affairs regarding uh, their enforcement um, or, or hands off or hands on within these spaces, either within the cannabis or the psychedelics um, on tribes and reservations? Uh, you know, an, an extension of that question, you were talking about the centers in Oregon. Are any of the tribes in Oregon running psychedelic uh, distribution or whatever the, the term is for that center? Are any of the tribes doing that or are any organizations doing that on tribal lands? Um, and then lastly, we've talked a lot about uh, the medicinal and personal use of psychedelics. Uh, has there been any discussion in California, Colorado, or Oregon regarding the spirituality and use of religious engagement within these uh, medicines um, as it relates to Native people. Thanks, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a really uh, challenging topic. Uh, I'm not aware of any you know, way in from Bureau of Indian Affairs, especially regarding psychedelics. Um, I've spoken with members of tribal communities in Colorado who feel as though they have been uh, completely ignored from the very beginning uh, and that things just kind of proceeded without any involvement 
or conversation with them. Uh, there was a seat on the Oregon board for a tribal member that went unfilled for two years. They finally did fill it, but that was after most of the rules had already been made. Um, Colorado, uh, Col you, you, I don't know if you are aware or not, Colorado had their ballot initiative and then the legislature came in and amended that ballot initiative. So it's, it's actually the amendment that's really uh, in effect that created a, um, uh, an, an indigenous and, and religious task force, or was supposed to, uh, but it still hasn't been formed. They just started receiving applications for that. Uh, I don't think there are any, uh, there, as far as I know, there are no service centers in Oregon on tribal land, no tribally uh, run or operated service centers. Uh, what, what, or what Colorado did um, with this amendment to their law really put them in a bad situation um, because that the Colorado law has two parts. There's the regulated program, there's the personal use. So regulation decriminalization. Prior to the amendment, uh, indigenous and religious use fell, you know, in it clearly um, fell within the personal use side and it was open, you know, whether or not, you know, how that might be accommodated if there were religious or indigenous communities that wanted to become licensed, you know, that that was open to interpretation. But with this amendment, uh, it added some lines to the regulated part that sort of put the state in a position of having to decide what constitutes bona fide religious use. And so they're, fi they're finding themselves having to decide know, who is a, a bona fide indigenous user, who's a bona fide religious um, a group. And uh, it's led to some really challenging discussions. It actually imposed some limitations on those groups that didn't exist. This, you know, may not apply to most indigenous or religious groups. It could apply to some, but they now can't, uh, they cannot advertise whereas previously they could. So there's sort of a freedom of expression limitation imposed on those groups. Uh, so there's some complexities that were created that you might want to learn about and try to avoid. Uh, there are some on the Colorado board who want to create a, um, a, a clear path for indigenous or religious practitioners to become licensed so they have the option either to work on the personal use side, unregulated, or uh, where they have certain restrictions, or on the regulated side where there really would be more of a, a peer with the facilitator. Um, there were attempts in Oregon to, to create that kind of path, but that was, that was resisted. Um, and so it's just a uniform rules applied there. So it's, it's, it's uh, very complicated. But as far as I know, there's been very little involvement from tribal communities. And, I, and as you know, they, they, many don't want anything to do with this. And, and that's part of what makes it com complicated. Thank you. All right, and we'll go to Paula and then we'll head over to Miro. Okay, um, thank you. I just wanna say, um, I appreciate kind of how you've laid it out for us today. And I know you're not offering legal advice, but what I'm hearing you say, and tell me if this is an accurate summary, is that Colorado has made it quite complicated in their efforts to separating regulated from personal use. Regulated involves, you know, medical health care, which adds all kinds of complexities regarding CMS, you know, Medicaid restrictions around um, drug use, the Controlled Substances Act. And so I, I appreciate one differentiating, and I think it's important that as a committee that we continue to differentiate our task force, whether we're talking about medical health care or, um, you know, decrim, legalization, personal public use. Um, and what I hear you saying is, you know, when you get into regulated healthcare, there's all kinds of complexities that that really involve CMS and Medicaid and lots of conflicts with the Control Substances Act. But personal use, where Oregon made an attempt to just really address personal use, there there is cleaner, it's less likelihood of any uh, FDA or FTC or DEA involvement. Um, but when they start to get into this kind of um, advertising around healthcare or medical use, it uh, puts them on a kind of a slippery slope and that there are some kind of models for personal use around, you know, certifying individuals for getting some permits to reuse or, or, or certifying facilitators that that um, 
you know, there's there's there are leaner ways to to kind of do that um, around personal use. So I just want to help us continue to differentiate because I think if we put this all in one big lump, we get lost and we don't know what are we talking about legal around medical, legal around around um, personal use, and so anyway, is that is that a fair summary? I, I think for the most part it is. Yeah, I think. Um, um, but I, I'm making in, an even finer distinction, you know, not only between personal use and medical, but there's personal use and then there's regulated medical and regulated not medical. And the Oregon is regulated not medical by law, the letter of the law. The, the, and I think what you said is true, that that's probably a safer route to go if you're concerned about conflicts. I mean, there are other considerations as well. It's not the only consideration. The issue there is that the Oregon Health Authority is not really enforcing its own rules in that respect. And the reason they provide is that they say therapy is not a uh, protected term in Oregon. Um, you know, it, it's not a term of art used to just, you know, only certain people can say they do therapy. Um, but I think they have the authority to, to enforce their rule against making medical claims. Um, so I, I do think that there are many good things about the Oregon law that if, I mean, if I was drafting a law, I would emulate, um, but I think there are ways to, um, implement much lighter regulation. And I, and I think there's some, you know, admirable things about that Massachusetts law that I sent you that really does kind of simplify things, uh, in a way that I do think conflicts less, um, but I guess if I was to do it myself, you know, I would, I would have some, I do like the idea of combining decriminalization with, you know, some form of regulation. And um, one thing I didn't emphasize before that I think is worth emphasizing is the role that investing in public education can play in promoting safety and harm reduction. Um, no state has really done that. Um, uh, in, in Colorado, they are talking about educating law enforcement, which I think is really helpful and important so that if you have police responding to a situation involving psychedelics, maybe they're not going into it with you know, misperceptions and that could, could really prevent some very bad situations. But um, a lot could be achieved by providing funding in a state just for educating the public, providing information. And that wouldn't conflict with federal law because you're just disseminating information. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to go over, I don't know if you have access, Mason, to this mural environment. Um, it's kind of like Prezi where it's like a 10,000 foot view, and then we have different sections with questions. So we have um, some kind of sticky notes in there related to some of the things that were in the legislation around kind of getting around these legal parameters. Um, the first being an administrative example to the Controlled Substances Act, the second being judicially created exemption to the Controlled Substances Act. The third being authority under the Federal Right to Try Act. Um, the fourth being FDA expanded access program. And the final one being to petition the United States Attorney General to establish more research programs. So I think we're trying to figure out legally what do we have to address around those? Are they possible? Which gives us better protections from the federal government. Um, and then I just put in a few extra, I think, keying onto what you're talking about, just doing more clinical trials in general, adult regulated use program that's within the state, um, and decriminalization, and then potentially federal exemption through RIFRA, which I know some organizations are exploring. And I know that that is a path for federal exemption that isn't really an easy fight, an easy one fight. So um, if you have any thoughts around you know those that would be really helpful for us to kick off our discussion on some of these legal parameters we need to address for our recommendations thank you yeah i'll just briefly comment on these i i think um some of these very clearly would not you know have any issue with conflicting with federal law so um the expanded access program for example connecticut's psilocybin act initially leverage that program that pathway it was allocating funding for people to utilize the expanded access program it actually ended up being changed and became more of just a garden variety clinical trial uh, but that is a possibility and because you you would just be leveraging existing fda regulation there's no problem there with um, conflicts um, in terms of these exemptions i i think it's an interesting concept um 
but I don't see these as viable um, pathways. In Canada, there is actually a province, uh, British Columbia has what's called a Section 56 exemption from the uh, C C Canadian equivalent of the Controlled Substances Act. It's the only one that exists in Canada. Um, I, we don't really have a pathway like that here in the US. I think what more likely would happen is uh, Minnesota might enact a law uh, or it might, or for example, it might utilize its right to try act. Minnesota has a right to try act that I was looking at last night. It might utilize that. And then if the DEA attempted to shut it down, you know, then uh, Minnesota would go to court and, and argue that, you know, the, the Controlled Substances Act doesn't apply. But um, in terms of some kind of preemptive exemption, I can't see how there would be a pathway to achieving that. And then the RIFRA is very interesting because um, those aren't, the DEA doesn't give them out, the exemptions. The, um, the organizations that have a, agreements with the DEA um, fought for those in court. So the UDV church and the Santo Daime church, and they're really the only two that have those. There are others that have applied and they, like you kind of implied, they, they get ignored or and nothing ever happens with them. They don't go anywhere. Yeah, thanks for laying all that out. Um, so I don't know if anyone on the task force wants to chime in and ask specific questions. Um, I know we do have a couple lawyers on here that might have some ideas around this uh, with Bennett and Adam, um, or if any of the physicians are curious or anyone else that wants to kind of pop in and, and ask a question. Paul, is your hand still raised from before? Or do you have a new question? Okay. One quick question. I know, you know, Minnesota, the governor passed the statute last May for the um, safe recovery sites, which is the pathway for Minnesota to eventually open a safe consumption site. Um, under, you know, governor statute, which I think Rhode, Rhode Island also passed similar statutory um, language last session. Did, did Minnesota do the legwork to kind of, uh, you know, work around the, the Federal Controlled Substances Act and the, the passing of that statute? I wonder if that's a question for Ari, if Ari knows that. Yeah, um, no, they didn't. So they're just um, waiting to see. I think the best case, and maybe Jeremy could chime in, and on this as well, but the I think what they're expecting is that if the federal government were interested in litigation, they would bring that litigation. And I think the best case that we have so far is in another judicial district um, where Philadelphia Safe House is located. And there's been a lot of like kind of jockeying back and forth, but it's it's not my sense that the federal government has much appetite for shutting one of these things down. But the idea is that like, you get the maximally protective language in, st in state statute um, to try to protect the people that are using the site and the people that are running it. I don't know if Jeremy has anything else. Um, <clears throat> no, not anything substantive. I mean, the last I saw, um, and I can go back and, and dig this up, I think the Department of Justice was reviewing um, uh, was reviewing some some issues in this case and um, had not um, made a determination um, regarding the, the Philadelphia issue that, that Ari mentioned. Um, so nothing really substantive to answer, but we're just watching it very closely and continuing to do our research. And I, I think it's a good... Um, opportunity to point out the difference between a safe consumption site where one creates a space where there might be health care professionals present, uh, where someone brings their own substance and uses it versus a center that's providing that substance. So, you know, in other countries, there have been attempts to actually, you know, to provide heroin or cocaine that's, you know, the source of that's very different than just creating a, a site where someone can use a substance. Because um, if you're at, if you're going back to that preemption question, you can make a persuasive argument that that is not obstructing uh, the congressional objective of the Controlled Substances Act, whereas provi actually providing the substance um, or you know kind of contributing to it in a more active way may. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chrissy, you have your hand up. Yes, I was just going to ask um, more of a blanket 
quick question for the legal work group that's going to also be discussed by Ari. Um, but from your perspective, um, could you just give like a one sentence um, why states aren't addressing rescheduling on the state level? Um, just because it's not something that seems like it's being done. Maybe I've seen like one state has maybe like discussed it, isn't really going anywhere with it. Um, but I know it was our legal work groups like first kind of thought when approaching it from a state statute and realizing that cannabis was um, medically exempt. Um, and seems like that's the approach other states are just creating laws um, and just kind of circumventing the their version of the Controlled Substance Act. But if you could just give a blanket statement about why states are approaching it that way, that would be really helpful, I think, for us. I don't know the reason. It could be a belief that um, you know, that's a more extreme measure than, I mean, there are a couple of different approaches one could take. On one end, it could be just saying that we're not going to enforce, we're not, you know, or we're not going to enforce the prohibition. So that would be sort of the approach that like the Netherlands takes with uh, marijuana. You know, they say it's, it's the discretion of our prosecutors to uh, decide to prosecute and they don't prosecute, you know, below a certain amount. So there's a whole range of approaches that could be taken from just not enforcing to completely remove and, and to making exceptions, like you said, or just completely removing from the state um, controlled substances list. But um, that's probably a more that would be, you know, be seen as more of a sort of positive action in terms of, you know, uh, interaction with federal law. So I, I think that's probably the reason, just taking a more kind of a passive approach to it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other burning questions right now um, for Mason around some of these questions um, that folks want to pop on camera? Or Adam, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Doctor, thanks again for being here. I'm just looking at psychedelicweek.com right now. Uh, which I believe is your publication. What what are some other resources you would point us to as our task force uh, digs into these legal issues and then regulatory issues? Like where would you suggest we look for for guidance? What resources should we be looking at? It's really difficult because there aren't a lot of attorneys and certainly not legal academics writing about these issues. It's um it's a very you know conser relatively conservative field even more so than medicine so you don't see quite the same exuberance that you see in the medical field to to enter this research area so it's difficult um a lot of um a lot of i see a lot of reporting about these laws that's not you know entirely accurate i sent you one good source the uh, robert robert mykos is a good um uh, you know, a real expert on um, federal cannabis, uh, uh, you know, the interactions between state and federal cannabis law. There's some other people uh, who write about cannabis. Alex Kreit is another. Uh, but things become much more complicated when you start talking about psychedelics because of all the, you know, the reasons we talked about. We're talking about different substances. We're talking about multiple substances. We're, we're suddenly talking about something that's um, much involves much more um, involve, involves healthcare a lot more. So there's not a lot there's not a lot out there in, to turn to in terms of like authoritative references on specifically on psychedelics. And you kind of do have to uh, you know make inferences from what's written about cannabis and and other uh, controlled substances. I'll give that some thought though. Thank you. Yes. I thank you uh, did you have more to add adam no thank you this has just been invaluable thank you so much yeah i appreciate you um, dr marks and, and being one of these legal scholars and really trying to dig into this and how it impacts all these different state programs and and medicine and things like that so really really grateful for your time and effort on this um are there, are there any more questions i want to just briefly be mindful of time and and but I do want to make sure everyone's concerns and issues are being addressed. Otherwise, I might have one final closing question for you, Dr. Marks. Anyone want to raise their hand and ask another question? So 
So I think one big question I have, and maybe a takeaway from your perspective and all the legal research you've done and experience working with other states and understanding the legal landscape of this is what do you think is the safest approach to protect us from federal oversight should the DEA decide to, or the FDA decide to really start to crack down on this, should their perception and sort of enforcement practices change as this gets ramped up across the nation? It's hard to answer that because uh, these options that are sort of laid out here are so different. You know, obviously just funding clinical trials would be the safest path of all when it comes to conflict. Um, as as with the expanded access, uh, once you get into right to try, that's you know um, there's that's a lot more um, debatable, and then certainly these regulated models are are much more you're going out on a limb much more. Uh, so it de- it really depends on what the priorities are and how you want to balance access and uh, safety with this these legal you know, conflicts. So it's, it's tough to, to say, but I think you're smart to be thinking it through (laughs) beforehand. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. We, you know, we heard this concept of states as labs and we're all kind of just figuring this out as we go, trying to use each other as templates, but ultimately none of us are in compliance with federal law, it sounds like. And we're just kind of hoping that there won't be a crackdown at some point. (laughs) Well, there is a, there, there are parties who hope to just pass things as quickly as possible in as many states as possible um, for many reasons. You know, one of them may be a, a hope that if they can reach a critical mass um, that, you know, the federal government might find itself in a similar situation with cannabis. Like it just would not even be possible at this point to go and crack down on every state for medical cannabis. Whereas the, there, but if there are outliers like Georgia, you know, that may be feasible to go and shut down Georgia's program. So it depends on, you know, if, if a state wants to be a part of that and just move as quickly as possible uh, or, or wants to be a little more methodical and thoughtful about it. And uh, it, it seems like you're, you're taking that approach. So that's probably a good thing. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap up now with this. Thank you again so much, Dr. Marks, for joining us and providing your perspective. And thank you to all the members for engaging. And so we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the working group status reports. And I'll hand it over to Chrissy to lead that. Thank you. Um, thank you. If I could interrupt for just one moment first, this is Stacy's voice that you hear. Jessica, is there anything else you want members to add on the on the mural? in terms of the questions that we've posed. We can give folks, I don't know, until the end of the week or whatever, so they can really be thoughtful in their responses. I just don't want to uh, not, um, I don't want to move on to the next item until we make sure everybody knows the space is here and we really want everybody, all of the members to weigh in here. So is, is there anything else you want to frame up for people before we move on? Yeah, um, thank you for that nudge and reminder. Um, So I think, so we have some questions posed around different paths we could pursue legally. It sounds like some of these just might not be possible um, or feasible. So um, I think I've seen one member, Stefan, kind of putting your name underneath some of those. So if folks could, you know, just maybe put your name under the program you think would be the best, because ultimately we need to figure out which legal pathway do we want to pursue, and that's going to help shape the policy and the regulations around how we actually implement that. Um, so getting a sense from all members, um, and we'll give you, you know, during this next week to be able to engage in mural and think about this and provide um, some ideas, put your name under the pathways you think would be most practical, um, given kind of your your seat on the task force and what perspectives you're bringing in and which of those you think would be better for your community or position that you're representing. If anything is missed, there's a section at the bottom to add additional options that you might think we should explore with the legal working group. Um, and then there's other sections around kind of the legislate, the, sorry, the policy and the regulation that are kind of tied to that. But um, with respect to the, the legal stuff, it would be good to get a sense of how people are feeling about the different approaches. Um, And if you could do so by Friday, that would be great. So we can put that all in and and come up with some consensus around which pathway we want to take. Paula, did you have a clarifying question there? Yes, please. So are we talking about the 
the the regulated medical health care, or are we talking about the public uh, decrim legalization? First of all, and maybe maybe we're talking medicine, so this says medicine, but I think we need to be clear about which which path we're talking about. And then I know uh, Mason mentioned the right to try, uh, so maybe that needs to be out there as the as a potentially more realistic or viable legal option. Minnesota's right to try. So we just want to add that. Absolutely. Yeah, I see. So I think if, if if that's something that you propose, you know, putting your name under there, maybe some additional resources of, of how to pursue that or all other approaches that aren't included. You know, these are just some of the high level ones we put both from the language and the legislation, as well as just some ideas of what other states are doing. So, you know, we get to decide what we want, you know, based on our state. Um, so it's it's up to us to, to, to navigate this ourselves. <coughs> And all ideas are welcome. There's no dumb idea. There's no dumb questions. It's, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so we need as much feedback and input as possible on ways to explore this. Thanks. So again, if all of you could, members could take until the end of this week to come back into mural, do some reflection on this big blue rectangle area, the questions that we've got posed in here, we'd, we'd certainly appreciate it. And just also reminding all of you that we posted everything that we were able to post from Dr. Marks up in that references box up above and to the right of this section. Some of the things that he sent, I couldn't, I couldn't get them to upload correctly. So my apologies for that, but I think I caught most of them. And Ranji, did you have another clarifying question? Not a clarifying question, just a favor. I've got a billion things that I'm doing this week, so I have things that fall off. So if perhaps in the middle of the week we can get a reminder for the rest of the group to sort of interact with the mirror, I'd really appreciate that. We can do reminders. I'm good at reminders, Ranji. Not a problem. We'll send something out for everybody. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jessica, back over to you. You want to set the stage for Chrissy and, uh, and uh, work group stuff? Yeah. Um, so I think, again, this is going to be a purely mural activity. So we're going to turn over to mural and Chrissy is going to lead the discussion. I think Chrissy and Ari are going to do some updates on the legal work group. And then we'll talk about some logistics moving forward with the other two uh, working groups. So do you want to go ahead and take that on and over, Chrissy? Yes. yes. And this is area. Yep. Area three up on the mural yes. here. Okay. Um, so I am going to try to keep it brief. Um, we have gotten some work groups scheduled. The legal work group met for the first time, like everyone is very aware. Um, legal kind of dictates other pathways. Um, so, of course, there are other recommendations to be had that are still very much important. Um, but getting a better sense of, which is why mural is so important, is like really giving your feedback. There isn't going to be a clear answer um, to what you feel like is the best approach. That's okay if it's more than one, but really it is just having a better sense of what is the scope of this work for everyone so that people can really get into not necessarily the detail details, but at least a little bit more detail than where we are now. Um, and so with that, um, we have our legal work group tomorrow. So if anyone is, you know, really interested in putting in their feedback to help um, influence that conversation, that would be really helpful to just get as much feedback on mural as possible for everyone to have a better sense of just the feeling of the group in terms of possible approaches. Um, regulatory, um, we've kind of done this specifically, regulatory will meet after legal each month. Um, so this month, the meetings are a little wonky, but we'll be meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. for legal. And then um, on Monday, next Monday at 4 p.m. as well. Um, but meetings will always be on the second Monday of each month for regulatory or the Monday after. Um, these task force meetings, whereas legal will be the Thursday of the week of the task force meeting. Um, these aren't um, open to the public simply just because no decisions are being made and there isn't a quorum. Um, this is very much a space for members to just really dig into um, some of the conversations that are already taking place um, in this group and then raising questions in a clear way in the future. So the work group for legal, um, for instance, we had the question raised by members about scheduling. Um, so it's really helpful to get subject matter experts as well to be able to confirm what direction that might be. So it might not necessarily be a vote, but having discussions on those topics um, for potential like future considerations as well will be important. Um, I did want to make one very clear note about policy work. Um, we are meeting this month, um, but it's not going to be its own standalone work group um, simply because of 
meetings and capacity um, for this work, we really want to ensure it's also involved within regulatory and le legal. So that's why there's a reminder. Um, our team, um, although very powerful, um, MMB is um, not just on this task force. They are working on many other um, advisory groups. So it's important to keep in mind that there are only so many of us that can do certain things. Um, and this is really reliant on um, you all sharing your resources, your networks, um, being able to provide um, your time and ability to collaborate in an organized way. So we really appreciate that time, but also please keep that in mind when we're working through everything. I want to pass it over to Ari, um, who has been our first volunteer for the legal work group update. Again, it was a very organizational meeting, um, but just to get the ball rolling as conversations continue, and I'll pass it over to you, Ari. Thanks. I don't have super a lot to say, like Chrissy allotted me five or 10 minutes and I don't really have that much because we're just, I mean, essentially we talked through what's up on this slide here. We sort of like walked through what's in statute and the, these big questions that are open to us and that, you know, Mason sort of is helping us think through. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Chrissy, I mocked up a little Venn diagram to that was helpful to me to sort of like think through what we're trying to do. So, you know, there's like state law and then there's federal law. And in the intersection of those two things, I think is what we're trying to grapple with today, what Mason was talking about. And I listed out some of those pathways there. Um, and so whatever is in, you know, sort of the, just the state law jurisdiction um, is one thing. And this might be like, you know, changes to Minnesota's Controlled Substances Act. But then there's also going to be an impact on what the federal law has to say. And so we're just trying to figure out what goes in that middle piece to make sure that these two things like aren't in conflict. Um, but beyond that, like we haven't proceeded much. And I can just say very briefly um, that we had our first meeting on January 10th that we're seeking to understand at baseline how did Minnesota's cannabis legislation reckon with reckon with our own state controlled substances act? Oh, thanks, Chrissy. Um, what existing statutes could be impacted by legalizing psychedelic medicines? And this is sections of the code that have to do with licensing, prescribing, distributing, et cetera. Are there new statutes that needed to be added um, about racial justice or reparations um, and other states statutory approaches to legalizing psychedelic medicines? And then from there, considering the best way to contend with the federal government's Controlled Substances Act. So um, I can just speak for myself personally, like I'm feeling a little bit cart before the horse in terms of today's presentation, because I feel like I personally don't understand what all the different pathways accessible to us are. Um, so I, I mean, for myself and the legal work group is meeting tomorrow, I in terms of timeline, I'm, I'm not sure what Stacy and others think is possible, but I would like a little bit more time for all of us to tell you all, like, what do these different federal pathways mean? What is the implication? For, like, what are they actually? Because I don't even know yet. Um, so I don't know if we can pu push back a week or two or, or whatever. I don't, I don't know how others are feeling. That's a little bit how I'm feeling. I'm feeling like, and we talked about this at our February meeting, like we would like for example, a literature review of the state approaches to legalizing psychedelic medicines. And Mason gave us a little bit of that, but like in more detail, what do these things actually look like? We'd like to hear from experts about um, the pathway that cannabis took in Minnesota, which was an exclusion from our Controlled Substances Act rather than a rescheduling. What can we learn from that process? Um, so we're, we're meant to meet again tomorrow. Uh, if any of you lawyers that are here will be there, I know that Adam was there last time. I think we were missing Bennett because he was a child. But um, like I said, I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a policy person. I'm more of like a subject matter expert. I sometimes play a lawyer on TV and I feel like I'm going to get sued for malpractice if I do this on my own. So um, please, lawyers, attend this meeting. That's hey, all I have. I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's. A great plug. <laughs> um, I will just follow, sorry. Um, I will just follow up by saying um, 
I think um, I can even speak for myself. I, at times, am very overwhelmed by the reality of what this work means and trying to conceptualize it. And I think that um, going back to like cannabis, for instance, like Mason um, mentioned, those are typically the people that are going to help sh shape some of this work where we've tried to identify people. Um, it's even within the cannabis um, legislation space, it's a very limited amount of people and they're not necessarily the most accessible or interested in um, necessarily dipping their toes in this space if it's not a direct part of their work. Um, so we are going to meet tomorrow, um, a lot to cover. Um, the, this is just a tentative and I think it's also important to know that these pathways it really might just come down to that you don't pick one pathway. It's like laying out a couple of options because thinking about it as a comprehensive report, you are presenting to the legislature what also you think is going to be the most digestible for them, ideally, but also maybe give options for maybe in the future what could be possible. So when you're thinking about questions like, for instance, rescheduling, is that something that's like not a question right now? It could be put off into the future. So these aren't questions that need to be answered, but you also need to take a stance of, are we picking one approach? Are we picking, maybe we look at a couple of different avenues um, and definitely learning those approaches will be a priority. So let's next time maybe really focus on setting aside some time to just define those and maybe take more of a, I don't want to say vote, but have every single person put their name beside things that they want to suggest to the state, um, at least with more of an understanding of what that might look like. So time will tell. We just want to keep things moving more than anything. Thank you, Ari, thanks, for that. And thanks, Chrissy. Back if yeah, there's anything um, to say, um, but that's it on my end. Thanks. So can I ask a follow-up question? Because I'm just curious, like, are others in this room or like are other members feeling like they have enough information to understand what those different pathways mean? No, some, some yeses and some no's. Like, is there, I just, I don't know. I feel like there needs to be more back and forth or like some information transmitted either from the legal work group or somebody else to members before the next meeting to help folks understand like what those pathways are. Otherwise I feel like the people are just doing the research on their own, right? Like how else are people understanding what these pathways mean? Yeah, I meant like presenting it um, in March, like going through each of the pathways for everybody in a way. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't worry. <laughs> there, this question won't be asked again next month with feeling the same way. That's the goal. But and it won't be asked necessarily in March if people don't feel ready, but we really do want to ensure that the groups can at least have a sense of where people stand in terms of their initial reaction to some of these things. And it looks like Adam's oh, got his Adam, hand go up ahead. too. Yeah, I, I agree, Ari, about kind of feeling cart before the horse or overwhelmed. To your point, Chrissy, there's just a lot that I don't know about. This is outside my personal practice area by a long shot. Um, but, you know, we're all here because we're passionate. I don't think there's going to be any substitute for doing the hard work. There's going to be a lot of reading. You know, hopefully you can continue to have good uh, guest speakers like Dr. Marks to provide some guidance. So I just, I it's going to be, it's going to be a big push for sure. It's going to be a lot of effort from a lot of people coming together. And I don't think there's any shortcuts for this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, and thanks, Chrissy and Ari, for that update. Is there more you want to talk about the working group? I do want to be mindful of time so we have time to finalize the charter and talk about the final report. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, thank you both so much. And we'll move on. I'll turn it over to Jess and Stacy for finalizing the charter. So, reminder the charter draft was sent ahead of the meeting with instructions to review. And so the time today is to touch on a few remaining sections that I'll call for a vote to approve by a two thirds majority of current members present. With the directive from the governor's office that we proceed rather than wait for more tribal representation, Stacy will walk us through the final adjustments, um, including conflicts of interest, scope of work discussion, and if there's any things that we wanna clarify or questions that we have before a motion to approve the charter. So I'll turn it over to you, Stacy. Yep, thank you. Uh, so. Uh, as Jessica said, you received the copy of the uh, most current uh, draft version of the charter in the meeting uh, uh, invitation. I'm also going to just click on ask to follow if you want to open it up on the mural 
this is where you can find it. So just say, yeah, I'll follow Stacy and just double click anywhere on the surface of the charter and it should open up for you if you want to do it that way. Either is fine. So I'll give you all a, set, a moment to do that and I'm going to turn off the cursors while I'm at it. And once you get the document open, I'm talking slowly so you can get there. I'd like you to go to page two, where you see the conflict of interest section. This was where I made my mistake last time we met and didn't have the uh, finalized content for you based on conversations and all the in-house stuff that you need to do to get this squared away. So this is the red line version. And um, you can see the addition of the underlined materials under that one paragraph description is what we're uh, recommending makes the most sense for this group. And it reads, further members realize the tension that can exist between the desire to support the best interests of the state and personal or professional interests. Therefore, to assure recommendations are ultimately made framed in the best interest of the state, the group will aggressively filter those decisions through their guiding principles for all major decision making. And you'll remember, and you can find those, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, guiding principles uh, on the mural will be over to the right of where you are right now. If you're up at the top, you've done quite a lot of work. Uh, in the first and second meetings, I think it was, where we really finalized those guiding principles. Uh, and if, again, you can just hover over my photo at the bottom and you can click on follow Stacy and you can get there. But that's that's the, the guiding principles. So that's where we landed. And I think what we kind of discussed, but you couldn't all see the language when we were together last month. So that's item number one. Item number two is just above that on the scope of work discussion. So if you go on the draft, just above where conflict of interest is, we had um, landed, I think, more cleanly on scope of work out of bounds. So out of bounds is commissioning new studies. Out of bounds is areas distinctly out of bounds based on legislation include prevention as it relates to undiagnosed medical conditions. And there's that to be determined thing because everything is in flux as we're learning more here about research methods uh, are developed regarding medical diagnosis versus preventative medicine, et cetera, et cetera. And then we pulled off for cleanliness that last bullet because we seemed like we were confusing, um, kind of confusing the issue for people. So that's the adjustment that we made in out of bounds. And the last thing that I draw your attention to before I open it up for any clarifying questions is just a just a quick change um, and get down there. It's on page four at the top uh, in terms of expectations for participating in ro remote meetings. Uh, just wanted to make sure um, that everybody knew um, that while we appreciate seeing your lovely faces on the um, uh, uh, meeting platform that you do you. And if you don't have the uh, bandwidth capability or if there's some other reason that being on camera is just not working for you, that's fine. We didn't want anybody to feel like it was required or we didn't want you because that's so not the right message. Doesn't make sense at all. So we gave that a tweak too. And with that, I'll open it up to see if there are any questions before then, we turn it back over to Jessica and she calls the question for a motion to approve the, the, uh, the charter. So anybody have any questions? I'll just uh, unmute and go. I've got a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, this is Guthrie. Uh, I'm looking at the bottom of page three, uh, refrain from writing letters or engaging in other kinds of communication in the name of the task force. Um, just sort of given my my broader role and and being the only person uh, currently representing tribes, I'm not representing the task force and outreach uh, communication, but I need to continue to gather more input from relevant stakeholder groups. Is that okay to to continue on in that manner without checking in with Dr. Nielsen every time? 
My yeah, I mean, I think answer. Yep, go ahead, Jessica, please. I was going to say, from my understanding, you know, I think we all can, you know, ping our various communities. Perfect. I think it's just you're not saying like I speak on behalf of the task force. So I think as long as you just have that kind of disclaimer, I'm speaking for myself as a member of the task force, but not for the task force, and not and about it, and then report back to us what you find. Thank what you. You're... Okay, one other question at the bottom of five when we're talking about members' appointments and selections. I think it would be great to say, you know. It talks about everybody that's supposed to be on this task force. And as we've learned, not everybody's been appointed or, or approved for this. And so I think that there should be some language in there that says we'll move forward, whether all of these appointments are filled or not. Mm. If that's what we're doing. Does anybody have a differing opinion on that one? Because I, I hear what you're I hear where you're coming from, Guthrie. I can only speak to that from what I've heard from the governor's office, and maybe Jeremy can can speak more to this of just that basically Jacob Smith said that we have a quorum of people being appointed, and that in and itself is a justification to move forward. So we're not like mandated to have a fully seated task force to to do this. And that was the answer that I got. And I don't know how much we can push back on that. If I'm understanding you right though there's no reason that we couldn't put a sentence in there saying, and we'll move forward, even if not all seats are not full, correct? I Guthrie, mean, isn't that what you were saying? Right, we can say yeah. what we want. Right. Yep. I'm not opposed to adding that if everyone else is okay, okay. with it. it. It might be helpful to note it as also the seat has been vacant since the task force started. So since this charter has been drafted, so um, just noting that the seat is vacant and that it's been, um, that we've started with a vacant seat would probably also just be helpful as a status update for the charter. And this is Renji and I'd also add, I don't have any problems with saying that we are moving forward without with this particular vacancy um, and that we started with the vacancy, but also in in um, in disclosure to, as I understand from what you said earlier, Jessica, that there it, it's not a desire not to seat this, but we're actively in the process of looking at that. So there's, there's a balance between uh, what we're saying. Anything else? Okay, Jessica, then I'd turn it back here over to you to call for a motion to approve the charter as written with the addition under the, under the member appointments and selection tab, bottom of page five. I'll work on the language, but that, this, that some seats have been vacant, but the group, um, I, I'll, I'll make the language nice, um, uh, has... Uh, charged to move forward or agreed to move forward, even though some seats have not uh, been filled. Uh, something, ugh, if you can go with me for that, I can't create good words on the spot, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jess if we need to uh, refine the language for anybody's comfort, I can stop and we can all work on that together or you can move forward uh, assuming there's a motion and a second. Yeah, um, you know, I think we can have that and folks can decide whether they want to vote yes or no, given that, you know, pending addition to the yeah. list and that will be in the final approval. So I think if there's no other um, comments or additions or feedback that folks want to bring up, um, then we'll go ahead and if I would ask that uh, somebody um, <laughs> initiates the the call to, to motion. Sorry, I'm not using the right language here. <laughs> Uh, a motion I, for approval. I, I motion for uh, an approval. I call for a motion for approval. <laughs> I move to approve. Who is that? Uh, I move to approve. Okay, so I'm Bennett, sorry. Bennett, thank you. And do we have a second? Like, yeah, I'll, I'll second, second the, uh, the motion. Okay, and that Nick, was Nicholas. Please. All right, so with um, approved and seconded, then the motion carries and we've nope. approved the charter. Nope. 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 Oh, sorry. Now nope. we need to vote. Still, sorry. We still need to vote. So technically you okay. could call for any discussion. So I would like to now call for any discussion of the <laughs> elements of 
before we move to a vote. Therein lies the problem with Robert's rules of order. It's confusing for everybody. So I think, Jessica, you're none, good. Hearing none, we'll set it out to a roll call to vote. Lovely. All right. I'm going fast, everyone. Courtney. Yes. Helen. Yes. Guthrie. Yes. Julia. Yes. Paula. Yes. Jeremy. Yes. Stefan. Yes. Margaret. Yes. Bennett. Yes. Uh, David. No, yes. Was off for, you, you there, David? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Nick. Yes, I do. Ari. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Kit. Yes. Jill. Yes. Ken. Oh, not Ken, not Ken, not Ken. Absent Ken. Andy. Yes. Michael. Yes. Adam. Yes. Raji. Yes. And Nolan is absent. Motion to approve the charter has carried. We're good. Excellent. Stacy, thanks for the guidance on, on all the Robert's <laughs> No worries. We're Don't get me started on Robert's rules. I won't stop. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we'll move on to um, our final section and talking about the final report and formatting for preliminary discussion. So for this, I'll turn this over to Jess Burke, who's going to walk us through um, the final report and some templates that we have to evaluate uh, to decide on that. So take it away, Jess. Thanks very much, Jessica. Uh, I apologize for my um, tech issues earlier. I think most of them are solved. Um, so before I even get into this final report outline, as Representative Smith said earlier, um, our first report did go to the legislature. Um, so now we can kind of move our focus to the final report. Um, and if uh, somebody could monitor, just if, I, if there's hands up, I've got two things up on my I got screen. it, yep. Thanks. Um, so we wanted to, so this right here is our tentative, very basic final report outline. Um, we'll have an executive summary where we'll summarize, you know, what's in the document and include our recommendations, probably a less detailed version of them. Um, an introduction section that'll talk about the task force charges and duties, task force membership, background section, um, and then the path to task force recommendations. So talking about, um, you know, all the meetings we had, talking about our work group approach, um, and anything that kind of will tell the reader how the task force got to the recommendations that are in this report. And then there will be a section on, a more detailed section on task force recommendations. This might include, you know, um, it, it could include, you know, how much money the task force thinks this is gonna cost or how much, you know, how much money MDH folks uh, estimate, you know, different things will cost. Um, because that can be very important to uh, legislators. Um, we do have, there's the uh, one of the duties that we, that we kind of don't talk about that much uh, because it's an after the fact is the public education plan the task force has for educating the public about the recommendations. Can't really educate the public about the recommendations until there are recommendations. So that's something we'll have to think about um, further down the line uh, that we'll want to include in the report. And then there'll just be a bunch of uh, appendices. Uh, you know, it'll be things like the um, legislation, member list, um, you know, any sort of background information we have. Uh, you can see what we included on the um, the report to the legislature, or you did see that if you, if you reviewed it. So Stacy and I uh, have worked on uh, at MAD, um, a lot of legislative reports. MAD has done a lot of these. And we wanted to provide you some examples that, um, so we've got the full reports on here. I think there's five of them. 
Um, the full reports are on here, but we've added stickies next to them to kind of give you sections to look at um, that are their specific examples that might be helpful um, as you start thinking about the work that the, you know, the work that you're going to be doing. The first one here is the task force on eliminating subminimum wages. Um, I, I am working on this one and it, we're actually wrapping up our work next month. This report, um, their report went to the legislature um, about a year ago. So the plan in this report, and this is uh, the sticky, the sticky here on page eight, um, it had, I think they had 15 recommendations and like the plan was the first five recommendations. Um, and the first recommendation was eliminating just eliminating the ability to pay sub minimum wages. Um, and then there were a few more uh, in this must happen section. And then there was an additional section of about 10 recommendations that would strengthen the system that support these folks and kind of prep the state to be ready if, so if the state did not eliminate sub minimum wages, um, there's general consensus that the the federal government is going to force states to stop doing this. Um, so these, this extra set of recommendations would also help get the state to a point where they're not, you know, on their back foot um, and playing catch up when this inevitably happens. Hasn't happened yet, but in that report, um, the legislature did, <clears throat> did adopt 14 of the 15 recommendations, um, which was kind of a big surprise. Uh, in this report, there's also an example on page 71 of getting into the weeds. The section has background information on um, the work that the work groups did. It's basically a section um, where there was detailed information um, about how the, the work groups and the task force got to these recommendations. It's cleaned up and organized notes basically from those work groups. Again, and that's a that's a very long report. It's like 170 pages. Um, so that one was very, very much in the weeds. The second report we have here is recommendations and stakeholder input for redesigning the Vulnerable Adult Act. On page 19 of this report, you'll find an example of what happens when members disagree with public sentiment. Um, and this, you know, this can be called out in a report. Um, if members, you know, if there are uh, on page 34, you'll find an example of what happens when members don't come to a total agreement on a recommendation. Um, but you can, you know, like in the report, you can, you can say, you know, only 16 of 22 or 23 members voted to approve this recommendation. So it's still, you know, it's still approved, but there were a few folks who, um, who did not agree. And so this can help kind of, it's a scoring system that can help legislators kind of understand how, how, how much the task force um, supported a particular recommendation if it's not unanimous. The next report is the Alzheimer's Disease Working Group. Um, in this report on page 47, you'll find an example of using stories from the community that can help legislators understand the human impact of certain situations. Um, you know, telling personal stories, it can be really helpful um, to help folks understand the issues that um, you're talking about in your recommendations or in the background of your report. And then we have one more. This is the sale of certain cannabinoid products work group from a few years ago. Uh, this work group you'll see on page seven had very, very detailed recommendations. Um, they focused uh, a lot on regulatory issues. Um, so there were, I think, five work group members and they each wrote their set of recommendations based on their expertise in the subject matter uh, with consultation from their agency. So we had the, um, uh, had agriculture, the Board of Pharmacy, Department of Commerce, and Public Safety. And so each, each one of those members kind of wrote their whole section of recommendations um, because they were all very knowledgeable on the issue. Um, and so we've got 
on page 20 of the work group includes other considerations that weren't necessarily part of their charge, uh, but the members thought the legislature needed to consider, for example, so one of those was creating an office of cannabis management. Um, and this was before uh, cannabis was, or, you know, before the, before legalization. So that was, uh, you know, that was the task force thinking ahead of something that might happen because the governor's office at the time was also working on a white paper on adult um, legalization of adult use. And then actually we do have one more, sorry, the task force on shelter. This example on page 49, um, it's another way of showing member support for various recommendations um, and communicating their reasoning again, um, and that's on sub subsequent pages. So this is another mural activity that we're gonna give you time because obviously there's a lot to read here. Uh, but once you've had a chance to review the reports or sections of the reports, you can add sticky notes indicating what you like about what these various groups did, what you liked about the reports, um, what you'd like to avoid doing in your work, um, or other notes or ideas you might have. And then below that space, down here, if I can I'll get there eventually maybe, we have a section on... And this is, you know, something something that we've been thinking about that we'd like you to think about is how would you define success as, as this task force? What would be a successful effort for you? Would it be having, you know, having one recommendation passed by the legislature, having them, you know, uh, it could really be anything. Uh, just, you know, we want to, we want to get an idea of what would be a successful outcome of this task force for, for you as members. And uh, I will stop and let y'all ask questions if you have any. So I'm not seeing any hands raised yet, just, <clears throat> but what I do wanna add, and this is Stacy, is uh, underscoring what Jess was saying that this is not something that you have to do this week we're sharing this because we know a lot of you have never been involved with writing legislative reports and what does that mean and i've never even seen a report and blah. and it's hard to envision a report or even how you approach your work as a task force without having some ideas of what the end result might look like and so our hope is that by providing these report examples flagging some pages in the various reports on things you might want to look at but not ever assuming that you're gonna read all, I don't know what, just five, 600 pages. That's not the expectation. There's a lot, stick yeah. Your nose, yeah. Stick your nose in where you're called to. It's not something that we might even get to <clears throat> at the next meeting. So you've got some time and this is the space in which you can put down some notes for the benefit of all of the members as we eventually get to the point of pivoting towards, okay, what's going in there? How do we need to approach things? Does that make sense? Give me some, like, give me some nonverbals, some, something here. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Does anybody have any specific questions that they want to ask of us on those sample reports? I yeah. have a quick question, because um, Jess, you had mentioned one of the reports, they adopted almost all, like all but one of the recommendations. So I think it would be helpful to know like how, which of these actually were successfully implemented and, and to what degree to kind of get a sense of what's kind of good information that the legislature will consider that hopefully, you know, all the work that we do does actually all get integrated into a bill. I can tell you that uh, the task force on eliminating subminimum wages is the one that uh, there was only one recommendation not adopted. I mean, there were some changes to some of them, but the one recommendation that was not adopted was eliminating the ability for organizations to pay subminimum wages. So it was, you know, if they had, if the legislature had approved that one, um, a lot of, you know, like so many things would have just fallen into place without, um, have without like the Department of Human Services having to rely so much on the the, the secondary plan to support um, the folks receiving services. And I can tell you that the that DHS is going back to the legislature this year 
and taking a different tack on that. They're, um, they're going to, and, and because the legislature's charge to the task force was, you know, uh, was eliminating some minimum wages, that they're abandoning that phrasing and changing it to um, guaranteed minimum wage for everyone, regardless of, you know, intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, and hoping that that, you know, looking, looking at it more positively like that will help them um, gain a little more traction uh, in the community and um, at the legislature. Uh, I honestly don't remember what, the, so the, my other one on there was the cannabinoid products. Um, and I honestly don't remember what happened with that because it went to the legislature in early 2020. Um, and, you know, all hell kind of broke loose there a couple months later. And, and the legalization, uh, you know, made a lot of that uh, stuff moot, I think, as well. And I don't know, Stacy can speak to the report she provided. Well, I, w I wish I could say that I sit and watch the legislature with bated breath after I'm involved with a report to track what's happened and what hasn't. But that's I'm, I'm, I'm in, in full transparency. I'm just galloping to wherever I'm needed to, to go next. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the Vulnerable Adult Act, I know that uh, in terms of redesigning some of the statutory language that impacts that program, there were changes that were made uh, in terms of being able to say, well, that was 75% of the recommendations. Should, I, I can't do that. I, I can't do that. Uh, in terms of the Alzheimer's report or disease working group, that was a requirement uh, for periodic reports by working groups to come back together and say, how is the state doing in terms of its preparedness to handle Alzheimer's disease across the state? And so it was a different kind of report in there. Although I'll, 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 I'll point out that those stories that are embedded in that particular board were really well received by the legislature, it really made the issues that are people in the state are feeling and how it impacts their lives. <clears throat> uh, and then finally, the task force and shelter, that's still so blooming new uh, that they're not to a point where substantive changes uh, have been made uh, based on any report. Um, and a, fi a fascinating um, and uh, gloriously confusing and every everybody is complex as what you're feeling, only in this case, it's related to a shelter. So I hope that bit of information helps and at least teases some of you into getting in there and looking at how these reports can be structured. And again, I wanna check in to see if there are any other questions in this area. We're good. I'm wondering if any of the legislators on the call have any thoughts about kind of adoption of these things and some suggestions as we think ahead to the, the final. Yeah. <clears throat> it is very hard as one member of the legislature to be able to say what or what not the legislature will do. <laughs> Shucks, um, really? Darn um, it. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> we, we don't even know what the legislature will be like. You know, it'll be another session by the time this report is, is delivered. So I think we focus on making the best possible report of what we are as a collective group, you know, uh, we feel is right. And then the Oh, you're cut out. Rep Smith, I that think. Was Andy, was wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Did we lose you? The audio is not working. Oh, shoot. Okay. All right. Well, Andy, if, oh, there, give it another try. All right. Sorry, uh, if you didn't hear what I said before, I said it's really hard to know what the legislature is mm -hmm. going to do with any recommendation. I would recommend just as one voice in a large legislative body that we should just do what we think is right and the correct uh, thing based on our findings. And then it is the legislature's job to find out um, you know, where the public support for that is or our perceived public support and, and pass it based on that. So I don't know how helpful it is to think about it as we recommend. 
um, maybe a little bit, but at the end of the day, you know, even the legislature I'm a part of now is going to be different by the time we deliver that final report. So um, that's just my two cents. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, Jessica, I think we've reached the end of the agenda. I know there are a couple stray announcements. Uh, that I want to give to, oh, Ranji, did I see your hand up? Ranji, I just hand up you. Mistake. Mistake? Okay. All right. So I know we've got a few uh, stray announcements. I would also welcome into that announcement uh, space any staff over at MDH that have been here with us uh, uh, quietly observing. Uh, if you've got anything that you needed to add to get into people's ears, that's great. Um, and some reminders about the upcoming meeting. So Jessica, is okay if I just go through my grab bag of things here and bring us bring us across the finish line? Yep. Is that all right? Okay, all right. Um, uh, so uh, some, some technical stuff here. A reminder to all members not to share the link to this Zoom meeting with anybody you, you might know. It's a closed session. Um, and so that's why we've set up the um, YouTube video. Um, so please don't share that information. We need to be able to control these spaces or uh, weird things can start happening. Likewise with Mural, that's password protected. So don't give out the link to that or we'll have no idea if something that's posted is from a member or somebody from the community. So please protect that information. Um, thanks for hanging in there with any technical glitches today. Appreciate that. I know oftentimes while I could hear everybody just fine, the video feeds would freeze and it's just the technology gremlins haven't at it today. Um, we really take your feedback on how these meetings are working for you seriously. And so I I very much appreciate the comments on, whoa, information overload. We need to back up, slow down, give us more time to understand options. We'll, we'll be working with that. Uh, and we'd invite the rest of you into that space of giving us some feedback. So if you look at the mural on the far right side, and I'll invite you to um, follow me, you can see that um, sailboat um, retrospective thing that we've used uh, before. If you would go in there, please, and give us some thoughtful comments about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what's working, what might not be working, what's kind of dragging us down, whatever it might be, really give us some feedback there. Uh, you can just grab a green sticky off to the side and write on it and plop it in the one of the four quadrants there. Um, again, we take that information seriously and pivot based on what you're telling us. So don't be shy about letting us know what's working or not working for you. Um, our next meeting is Monday, March 4th. That's the next full group meeting. It's not to say that there aren't some working groups that are gonna meeting, be meeting before that. And that is the, the list of what I've got. Jess, Chrissy, anybody else from the MDH team have anything they wanted to alert the whole group to? Um, just let me. Yeah, go ahead, Chrissy. Um, just let me know. I'm sorry, there's just uh, feedback. Um, if yeah. anyone has not gotten an email um, invitation and is interested in a work group, please let me know and I'll add you. Um, I should have everyone else. And then also if anyone wants to be taken off um, that hasn't told me already, please also let me know. Thank you. Okay. We will send out a reminder uh, mid to late week um, about the mural activities we asked you all to take part in. Excellent, okay. All right, then Jessica, I'll turn it back to you to wrap things up and all that good stuff. Great, thank you, Cece and Jess and Chrissy and everyone else for joining. Uh, thank you all for your participation and engagement and preparation for this meeting. And um, I know he's left, but again, a big thanks to our, our special guest, Dr. Mason Marks, for giving us some kind of ground truth realities of what's going on and helping inform our work moving forward. Um, so I look forward to the working group updates and chatting with everyone uh, next month. So thank you everyone for attending and hope you have a good rest of your week.
Thank you. Bye, everyone.